I may have your attention, I'd like to call to order the um, study session for the City Council of the City of Wee Ridge, Colorado uh, for November 5th, 2018. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, our first order of business, and as in most of our meetings, is citizen comment on the agenda items. And I have a, a sign-in sheet. If you have not signed in on the sheet, don't worry. We will have an opportunity for you to speak after the people that have signed in have spoken. So uh, I will call the um, first speaker and the person on deck if I, when I uh, call you. If you'd uh, sort of come to the podium and give us your name, spell your last name, give us your address. And uh, the timing on tonight's citizen comment is three minutes. So um, we will start there. And Ann Garcia is our first speaker, and Stephanie Garcia is on deck. Okay, and your daughter's name? Stephanie. Stephanie? Okay, then our second, or we'll go to Stephanie Garcia speaking, and uh, Valerie Garcia on deck. Um, good evening. I want to first note that I incorrectly listed the address in the official communication to you as 4055 Field Drive. It's actually 4055 Everett Street. Um, my name is Stephanie Garcia, and I'm the person who received the subdivision approval for 4055 Everett Street. This prompted City Council to enact an emergency moratorium at its last regular meeting. I am here to correct misstatements and to respectfully request that you reconsider and lift the moratorium as soon as possible. There were countless inaccuracies testified to at the last council meeting, and I want to share accurate information about my plans and motivation for the new home. It is not a two and a half or three story home. It is not a slot home. It is not a trailer house. I do not want, nor do I intend to remove all the trees on the lot and the utilities are not running underneath the new home. I am not in this for the money, as has been indicated. If I were, I would have already knocked down the original small home and been well on my way to constructing <coughs> a 35-foot tall home in its place. Instead, I am rehabilitating the original home for my mother and building a new home for my brother and his family so they can stay in the Bel Air area while downsizing and readying for retirement. If there is a shortcoming or complaint about the administrative subdivision process, please do not punish me, my plans, and my already approved subdivision. The process I followed was not only affirmed, but expanded in 2014, and this could not have been done without public comment, input, and support. To prohibit me from building my home based upon unfounded concerns and displeasure with the subdivision process is very unfair. I followed all the rules and regulations required. I voluntarily and responsively reached out to neighbors in advance of the approval when I learned of their concerns. They did not respond to me, but instead presented to this city council misinformation about me and my project. I continue to invest time, energy, and money in this pursuit, and unless the moratorium is lifted, it will cause me additional expense. My real estate efforts have always been driven by character preservation and or neighborhood stability and revitalization. In this case, my massing, scale, and design was informed by Envision Wheat Ridge and its survey findings on homes, as well as my personal review of the homes in Bel Air. I approach this in a thoughtful, considered way and not in the way a profit-driven business person would have. I have held off finalizing my elevations in the hope of listening to any neighbor concerns or critique, but it has been over five weeks since I made the initial offer, and I haven't heard from anybody. However, if it would help lift the moratorium, I remain open to sharing and reviewing my plans in the hope of correcting misperceptions and mitigating concerns about my home's impact on the neighborhood. In conclusion, the building permit moratorium is based on misinformation and unfairly targets my property. It is not just financially costly, but it's emotionally costly to everybody involved. I therefore respectfully request that at City Council's next regular meeting, one of the council members who voted in favor of the moratorium offer a motion to reconsider that moratorium. Then at that same meeting, I request that the whole City Council vote in favor of the motion for reconsideration. And then finally, that the City Council vote to lift the moratorium. That's the end of my comments, and I would like to take the opportunity and extra time to 
read an email that I just received from a neighbor, and I'll redact the name and address. Ms. Garcia, I'm one of your new neighbors at XYZ. I just read your very well-written letter. I wanted to let you know that I appreciated it very much and that for whatever it's worth, I'm sorry about the stress and hassle I imagine this has caused you. Sadly, there was very little information shared with us through the grapevine, and what was shared now appears to have been half true or untrue. We support the neighborhood collectively, working to preserve the aesthetic character, but we felt that it was untimely and unseemly to attack someone who had followed the rules, even if we had concerns about the final product. There are certainly other examples of large new homes that are out of character, and I don't recall anyone making a fuss about those. Changing the rules going forward is one thing. Attacking someone who followed the existing rules is another, and I was not in favor of this challenge. We signed the neighborhood position partly because of some missing and misleading information, but mostly just to keep the peace with the neighbors because we figured nothing would come of it. We still don't believe anything will, but if we'd known the facts of you described them in your letter, we definitely would have refused to sign. Anyway, I just wanted you to know that we support you and we genuinely welcome your family to the neighborhood. And that's the end of my testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Valerie Garcia and Taylor Garcia on deck. Hello, my name is Valerie Garcia and I live at 4087 Field Drive. I'm married to Stephanie's brother Mark and we've lived at our home for nearly 20 years. Like many who testified on October 22nd, we love our neighborhood and treasure the mature trees, winding streets, and gentle hills. We raised our two daughters here and as a young family we attended the parades and parties in the special neighborhood. As typical of empty nester homeowners, we have been contemplating a downsize and don't need a 3,600 square foot home, but we love our location so much, I couldn't imagine leaving Bel Air. When Stephanie asked us if we could help out with my mother-in-law, we agreed to do so, but we didn't want to return to the Sloan's Lake area, so we all began to look for a home for Anne closer to us. When Stephanie bought the house up the street, we were excited because of the proximity, but also because the home had space enough for her to build a large enough garage for both her mom and for my husband to store his toys, like many in the neighborhood have. After researching garages for the site, she discovered that instead of building a thousand square foot garage, detached garage, she indicated she could build a home for us and have garage space for all of us. It seemed to be the perfect idea, except for the fact that my daughters would find it difficult to leave the only home they've known. Stephanie, Mark, and I decided we wouldn't tell the girls of the plan and instead let them see the home that their auntie is building and organically get excited about it. Consequently, we asked her not to disclose the home was for us. It was recently become necessary to share with my girls what we're thinking, and that seems to be working out fine, but the potential buyer we had for our home is no longer willing to be in limbo while we figure out our future. I just can't understand why building a smaller home than most in Bel Air and on a larger lot than on the same street is such a concern and distress. My sister-in-law had to design a small enough home for us to afford, so I assure you that it is not a three-story monstrosity. We would never choose such a thing. We're preparing for retirement and plan to spend more time at our vacation home and have no need for a trophy home. Please reconsider the block you have on the building permits and let Stephanie build the modest scale home on the previously weed-filled lot. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tyler Garcia and Jennifer Apple on deck. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Jennifer Apel, and I am the broker owner of Nostalgic Homes. I'm the owner of several Wheat Ridge properties myself, and I grew up here. I am the realtor who sold Stephanie the property at 4055 Everett. I watched the October 22 Wheat Ridge City Council meeting, and I was nothing short of shocked. At every opportunity, Stephanie's character and her motivations were attacked. The person described at the meeting is not the women I have known since 1996 
when she bought a home for her parents in the Sloan's Lake neighborhood. After seeing the video, I felt compelled to make a character reference and offer insight into her property acquisitions. Stephanie is the least greedy and most preservation passionate client that I have. I have in so much that when myself or one of my 27 brokers has a, shall we say, unique property that requires somebody with a careful eye, it is offered to Stephanie first. And that she is able to offer the vision and analytic ability to make sense of the most challenged properties. She never views them as a teardown like most investors would, nor does she use the term return on investment as an analytic in her purchase. I know other realtors view her in the same manner. She is and always has been respectful of neighbors and neighborhoods. She chooses not to purchase a home that requires rezoning. She is quiet and thoughtful in her purchase choices. She never knocks on doors to buy homes and she only buys when there is a pre-established willing seller. She does not exploit sellers, neighbors, neighborhoods, or buyers. She has turned down countless quick money fix and flips from me alone simply because they don't speak to her. She enhances property with an eye toward renovation and preservation balanced with the economics and today's lifestyle. I have heard her use the term adaptive reuse for commercial and mixed use properties because like me, she values repurposing old structures and returning them to the market as a true benefit to the neighborhood. She is quiet and a reserved person who steps aside from the spotlight so you'll not find her in too many press clippings or interviews or glad handing of the neighbors. She likes their privacy. She's a little bit difficult to know. While she is very socially skilled, her reserve keeps her quiet and often a bit standoffish. She's bright and serious, so warm and fuzzies are not of her nature, and perhaps some of the residents have misinterpreted that truth about her. She is so understated that I'm certain most of you do not know that she was the original partner in the, in the iconic transformation and nationally recognized Olinger development in Northwest Denver. Most have heard of her former partner, but very few of her, and that's the way she likes it. She financed this project completely on her own. She wrote out a very difficult economic market through 2008 and 9 when many were returning their properties to the bank. She sold her partnership in 2012 when transformation was complete and the project was stable. She is very selective in what she purchases and it does not surprise me that she is not exploiting the full upside of 4055 Everett and has instead chose a preservation conscious home in lieu of the money grab that she is accused of. This is the Stephanie that I know. I see my time's up. I still have more time. I still have lots more to say, but okay, thank you. I don't refer to her as an investor. Rather, I see Stephanie truly as a neighborhood partner. Any neighborhood would be lucky to have her working in it. And I've taken her into some very challenged locations to make the investments that she has, and she has only returned product that has been of true benefit to the neighborhood. She takes great pride in what she does because she values the neighborhood she's working in. She values her reputation both through the project and after the project is sold. Her projects are her resume and I'd be happy to share addresses with any of you so that you could see what I'm describing. I find it hard to believe that she ever contemplated anything described in the October 22 meeting. It is simply inconsistent with her long-held character and values. I am blessed to be a top 1% broker in the Denver metro area, so I'm not sharing this professional information with you all to ingratiate myself to her because my career is not contingent on Stephanie's business. 
Rather, I'm providing you with this information to give you a 20 plus year perspective on this woman. Some of her noteworthy and award-winning projects have been the Talmadge Boyer Lofts at 30th and Umatilla, 1729 Central in Lohi, the first ever new construction property. The Olinger development, which many of you have probably socialized at and had a cocktail or perhaps a bite at, at 16th and Boulder Street. 500 Garfield, where she preserved condos in a deco building. 2540 through 44 18th Street with two units there that she carefully and thoughtfully renovated. 2104 Stewart Street, which was a seamless preservation, renovation, and addition to a stately 1930s Tudor. There are countless other homes she's improved in order to sell and secure their future as, as, a long stand, as long standing residences. By making substantial investments, she raises the value above that of the land to assure that they are literally standing in the future, just one of the many preservation tactics that she uses. I ask that you keep this in mind as you consider the information before you now and in the weeks to come on her build, on her build at 4055 Everett. I assure you, that Stephanie Garcia is, a de is deeply committed to the continued success and the wonderful lifestyle that the Bel Air community represents. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Angela Appel. And Valerie Noss Beckler, Valerie Nossler Beck on deck. Good evening, Council. My name is Angelica Apel. I am a realtor and proud Wheat Ridge resident. I sell many homes here in Wheat Ridge. I'm testifying tonight out of concern for the implication of prohibiting building permits for single family infill homes. I understand the home in question is spoken for, but I wanted to let you know I have many clients right now who are looking for such a family home in quality established Wheat Ridge neighborhoods. The Envision Wheat Ridge plan indicates a need for more diverse housing stock and acknowledges that the majority of homes are too small by today's standards and that smaller homes may be impacting the city's ability to attract more affluent buyers as well as what the plan calls, calls healthy households. If this particular prohibition is related to character, that is subjective, but when past practices permit the invasion of clearly out of character homes, then that argument becomes useless. There are many examples of this in the Bel Air neighborhood. The three-story Art Deco inspired home towers over its neighbors on every side. There's a tile roofed Mediterranean home that is well executed, but size materials and styles do not match the neighbors. The aforementioned homes again are within or within blocks of this proposed infill homes. How can these be of acceptable characters yet so very different from all of that that surround them? Bel Air used to be a, home, a, a neighborhood of modest and sprawling ranches. It has not been that for quite some time. Yet despite its evolution, did I run out of time? No. Okay, this neighborhood, um, has managed to remain attractive, desirable, and a model, model neighborhood in Wheat Ridge. Permitting infill, an infill home does not diminish character. I ask that City Council reevaluate its ban on this building permit as it is a slippery slope to outright design dictate, thus greatly inhibiting growth, new housing stock, and other state of objectives of the Envision Wheat Ridge plan. Wheat Ridge, like most of the Denver metro area, has a dramatic housing shortage, and this prohibition would dramatically put Wheat Ridge behind. I truly love living here and working here, and hope Wheat Ridge will grow progressively. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Val Nossler Beck and Jim Kazmarek on deck. Hi, I'm Val Nossler Beck. I'm at 4325 Everett Street. I um, wanted to just talk briefly tonight about the neighborhood revitalization strategy. Um, I think 
you guys are gonna have a presentation on that this evening. Uh, I wanted to speak as um, a member of the Cultural Commission and as a member of the Urban Renewal um, Committee to just talk about how exciting the work and the conversations that are happening out in the community are surrounding the neighborhood revitalization strategy. I'm gonna call it the NRS moving forward. <laughs> um, <laughs> So with the NRS, um, something that they've been uh, able to accomplish is have having some meetings um, with neighborhoods and one-on-one -on -one conversations about what um, residents in Wheat Ridge really want to see um, in their shared vision for the city. And a lot of times in these conversations that we're having here, like in planning commission, our own council, or in some of the other commissions and those types of um, meetings, we aren't hearing what um, the neighborhood neighborhoods really want. And what we've been hearing a lot about, um, I've just been a participant, um, is more about, we want more walkability. We want the type of zoning that's going to um, allow for better infrastructure that heads, heads us into a future that allows for us to access all of our great parks um, and uh, have some more mobility from the pla to the places that we, we love about our community. So um, I'm just wanting to, to chime in here and thank you all so much for paying attention to um, the input that you're gonna hear today. And um, I just wanna support the great work that's going on with the NRS. So thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim and Steve Kinney on deck. Jim Kazmarek. I am Jim Kazmarek, um, 4076 Everett Street. I live in the Wheat Ridge neighborhood and I've lived there for 21 years. Just really, really appreciate the fact that we live in such a beautiful community. And also that um, our biggest opposition to the lot split and the build is that it's just basically gonna take away the beauty and the ruralness of the neighborhood. What we really enjoy is the quietness, the fact that Wheat Ridge is not, it embellishes kind of a rural type atmosphere and we're not all crammed in on top of each other, like what Denver is trying to do with all their gentrification and builds of the multi-unit housing. So we're just kind of opposed to doing that lot split and doing the additional build because we think it'll take away the beauty of the corner that that property sits on and the access will make it more difficult as far as driveways, closeness to the street, if you've ever been on that particular corner, you would notice the beauty of it and the open space that it provides and the views of the mountains. So whatever kind of structure is gonna be built there, we just feel that that's gonna deter from the neighborhood and kind of make it more crowded and open up the opportunity to other folks to do the same thing in our really blessed neighborhood that we love to live in. And that's really um, the reason we oppose it is because we want to keep Wheat Ridge kind of a rural, quiet, uh, nice community to live in that's walkable and not make it more congested and crowded. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Kinney and Gail Thompson on deck. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Council. My name is Steve Kenny. I am a Wheat Ridge resident now for just slight of five years. I live at 2870 Newland Street. I met Stephanie tonight for the very first time. I um, have known Angelica and Jenny for many years and think they have the greatest amount of respect for them. I'm here though to speak about my own situation and that is that I am among those who has a lot that was split through an administrative action. Um, it was completed about two and a half years ago. I did this with this specific intent for my parents who moved to Texas to take care of her parents about 22 years ago and cannot afford to move back to Denver so that they could live in my house and I will eventually build a new house. And 
I spent more than a year. I, I spent more than $10,000 between three surveys and jumping through a lot of effort in this process to do this parcel split. So my extra lot now is next to my existing home that I've lived in for almost five years. And if this moratorium goes into place, and if there were changes to this parcel reconfiguration that occurred, it is grossly diminishing my property rights. And that is completely, completely unfair. This, this is a, this to me personally smacks of a lot of greed and a lot of frustration and poor communication on the part of those people in the community. And this seems like a knee-jerk reaction, and this to me is unacceptable. We have to recognize that, that things are changing, and that despite the fact that change is at times uncomfortable, that, that living in this city as if it is still 1964 is not realistic. And I can tell you that if my property rights are diminished, I will pursue legal action. So I, I think that it would be good for us to sit down and have a thoughtful discussion about how all of these pieces and parts come together and how maybe we can talk about a, um, a forms-based zoning approach that would ultimately mean that the community is changed in the future in a way that fits contextually with what's already in the neighborhood not making these absolute hard and fast decisions that are diminishing people's property rights. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gail Thompson and Chris Chidley on deck. Hello, my name is Gail Thompson and I live at 4020 Everett Street. Um, my husband and I, as I spoke a couple weeks ago, uh, we expressed that we live across the street from 4055 Everett. And at that time I had said that I had just learned that a home was going to be built in front of the current home at 4055. Um, and I expressed also at that meeting that I didn't even know that that was possible. Um, and I was very disappointed to learn about that, as well as our neighbors to the north of us who said they didn't know that was happening as well and they had just bought their house. Um, <clears throat> I encouraged people to take a walk through our neighborhood, take a look at the streetscape. And I noticed that a lot of people have been making comments about the characters of the home, uh, homes in our neighborhood. I wouldn't want somebody to tell me what to do with my home and um, what color to paint it or what kind of roof to put on it. And we are seeing a lot of change in our neighborhood. Uh, that's okay, I, I don't wanna live in an HOA. But it is alarming to learn that you can build a house in front of a house on a street where every house is kind of set back and we have deep lots. And I think that's what we're concerned about. I know uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Stephanie has most likely done an excellent job on all of her previous projects. But I'm concerned about my neighborhood, my street. And I hope that your study session takes into account that building a home in front of a home, is, it's a scary issue for lots of people living on our streets and thinking about our own property values. Um, this is not a debate, in, in my mind, about weeds or, um, you know, lack of communication. It is, is simply taking a look tonight in your study session about what is best for our Bel Air neighborhood in moving forward and whether or not splitting a, a lot and building a house in front of a house is the best thing for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Chidley and Rachel Holteen on deck. Uh, 
Mr. Starker. Uh, my name is Chris Chidley, as I tried to say no, several I'll, times I'll, before. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. probably say it wrong again. Don't worry. <laughs> keep, keep, keep That's why my company name isn't named after me, because nobody gets it right. Thank you. Not to worry. I live uh, at 4020 Everett Street. Uh, this is the house that is opposite. Uh, my wife just spoke. Uh, I spoke two weeks ago. The main input, the main content of what I described two weeks ago is also followed by 50 residents that are in our neighborhood uh, that signed a joint letter that was sent to the members of the council uh, in regards to what Envision Wheat Ridge is about. Not a particular person, not a particular developer. Uh, this, this appeal that we asked for two weeks ago was presented to the council um, that was there. Um, that group of members um, reviewed and discussed items to do with Envision Wheat Ridge. Envision Wheat Ridge, what we, what we see and what we had, had considered is a wider vision, and not simply this property at 4055 Everett Street. There, there, are, there are other properties in the area that um, we brought light to. Um, Following uh, the end of the discussion that we had two weeks ago, um, our council member, Larry Matthews, spoke on, on his thoughts in regards to what that was. The council members discussed this at length. They made a decision. They made a temporary uh, hold on uh, subdivisions in terms of development, temporary being the word. Uh, one of the three things that we pointed out to you was Bel Air is one of three neighborhoods that is cited to um, exemplify what Wheat Ridge is about. Um, it is re repeated through Envision Wheat Ridge, which I will keep on saying, that uh, the maintenance, the preservation, and the protection of, of neighborhoods like this is very important. Um, we gave examples of what a flag lot is. A flag lot typically is behind a house where the lot is incredibly deep, such that when the house is added to the, to the block, the house is actually behind, and the streetscape and the, the neighborhood is, is seldomly changed. Uh, tonight's study, study session um, has five options, um, which uh, I believe you're about to discuss. And it was asked of me by the residents of the neighborhood as to which one of those options um, would be uh, more considered. Um, I'm not going to read it out loud because I'm assuming that like, you will discuss that. Um, that's option four. Um, I leave you with this um, message that like we or I stated a lot of what I discussed two weeks ago in consideration to Envision Wheat Ridge and I would request at this study session that uh, Larry Matthews speak a little bit more on, on what he said two weeks ago because a number of you were not here at this meeting. Uh, I thank you for everybody else's time and consideration in terms of their thoughts and views to do with this lot. And I leave you with the simple statement that building a house in front of a house is what most of the residents have issue with. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chidley. Our next speaker is Rachel Hultine and Kathleen Martell on deck. Good evening, Mayor Starker, Council and Planning Commission. My name is Rachel Hultine, and I'm here tonight just to share a couple of thoughts on the Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Update. Um, it is a, a big and exciting process, and through the process so far, the 26 people who've been impaneled with the steering committee have been engaging in robust community outreach to ask initially the question, for Wee Ridge to be successful in the next 10 years, what needs to change and what needs to stay the same for us to continue to be the great place we love today? And I think um, a couple weeks ago when this was being discussed, Larry Matthews, I think, really put the point so clearly is, you know, who is Wheat Ridge, what is Wheat Ridge, and what is, what is so critical to who we are that we want to make sure we're clear that we need to retain it, but we need to do that in the face of embracing inevitable change. 
And change happens whether we direct it or whether we avoid it. <laughs> Um, and I am much more excited about the prospect to engage as many viewpoints and residents as possible to ensure that we are leading change and that we're ensuring that the change that happens over the next 10 years builds on the success of the last 49 and a half, 49 and three quarters. <laughs> Um, but, but we can only do that if we're hearing all the voices and asking the right questions. The discussion tonight really focuses a lot on some of the market indicators and economics of our city. And those are things that can be measured and put into graphs. And there are some beautiful graphs. I love graphs. I like data. Um, but they don't always capture the stories and the passion that makes Wheat Ridge a place that I love. And I'm looking at a room full of people who care enough about Wheat Ridge to be here tonight. And I think, you know, the, the comments on the, the second agenda item that we've been hearing, you know, really indicate that these are complicated issues. And when you scale them down to the neighborhood level, they play out differently in different neighborhoods across the city. Um, but what doesn't play out differently is the need to have working infrastructure. Um, I met with a prominent Wheat Ridge developer in the last week, and he is really bullish about doing what would be his fourth or fifth project here. And he said, we can't even think about it because the infrastructure under the roads isn't something that we can actually afford to deal with. Um, so we just need to remember that these are complicated issues. And I'm really looking forward to the next seven months of community engagement. I appreciate Councilman Urban sent out a postcard to his constituents, it landed in my mailbox, encouraging participation. Um, I encourage you know, all of you guys to please invite people. The city website, I think, has the sign up genius with all of the dates and meeting times. Um, but I really hope we can find a way to scale down to neighborhood voices, so neighborhoods like Bel Air, where I live too, sort of, just, just north of that, can be clear on what is unique to Bel Air, but while we can still move forward with a unified vision of really vibrant corridors and enough infrastructure to attract the best that the state has to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Martell and Sandy Nash, Nance on deck, pardon me. My name is Kathleen Martell. I live at 6455 West 31st Avenue. Um, it's, I tend to follow Rachel a lot when I sign in for these things and it's awesome to follow her and it's really hard to follow her. Partially because I can say I agree with everything she just presented and it's also hard to sometimes think of more information. But I'm, I'm also on the Neighborhood Revitalization Steering Committee, or the NRS Steering Committee, and first I want to thank City Council for um, addressing this again and allowing us and empaneling us to address this big, big project of a Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we're in our second round of community meetings, and in the first one we looked at what are the things we want to stay the same? And what are the things that really need to change for Wheat Ridge to be successful? And right now we're going through community meetings where we're talking to people about, you know, what is the cost to get what we want? And for every big thing that anyone in Wheat Ridge really wants, there's a cost and there's an offset. So it, there have been some really interesting conversations and some really, really meaningful perspectives and people who really have passion points of what they really want to see and passion points of what really, really needs to change. And I would just like to say that I've met so many community members through this process where, um, who I might not have met otherwise, and I've just really appreciated those conversations and I really hope that everyone here, um, as you're looking at neighborhood specific topics, as you're looking at things that affect all of Wheat Ridge, um, please participate in those discussions. They're, they can be quick pop-in discussions. You can have a long conversation. Um, the last one I attended, you know, we were trying to talk through two primary topics, but as we drug into different perspectives, you know, in the city of Wheat Ridge, there were so many different conversations that came out of it. We went in so many tangents that were such great conversations, and I just really am excited about bringing all of this together and. Um, uh, the update you'll get today about the progress we've made so far and the progress we're going to make. I'm really excited and I think we're going to make some good recommendations. So thank you again for impaneling us and I look forward to more work. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Sandy Nance and um, Greg Veter on deck.
My name is Sandy Nance. I live at 4097 Field Drive. Um, I really appreciate Stephanie's letter. I think that had the neighborhood had a chance to talk with her before all of this decision making got so far down the road, it would have maybe helped things a little. We, there was a strong request made of Ken Johnstone, the community development manager, to hold some kind of a public hearing on this issue that there was so much opposition from the neighbors about. Um, he said because none was required, he wouldn't. I was under the impression that anything that neighbors wanted uh, a discussion about, um, that the city could hold a, a hearing about it. Um, there have been, Stephanie's letter was just shared this afternoon. Um, I, there are a lot of people who are out of town uh, or in other meetings or unable to attend. I did get feedback from one fellow saying that he appreciated the information about, uh, about the family. However, he said the family won't own it forever. And, and the, I think the thing that people were getting at, trying to get at was, and it was kind of the, the point I was trying to make about talking about President Eisenhower's brother-in-law who was the developer of this. And he intended that there be this elegant development of, of homes on spacious lots really nice homes. He set them at different angles to make the neighborhood different and windy streets to make it different. Um, and what he didn't want, uh, it, with the, there's a couple, there's one other small home that I can think of on the lot. And yes, this home was there, probably the original orchard keeper's home. Um, and that's cool that Stephanie wants to keep it. I think that's great. Um, but this was not about small homes on small lots. And unfortunately, after Stephanie's family sells this lot, this, these homes, that's what the neighborhood will be left with, was small homes on small lots. Um, and I don't think that's, that's really what the original intent was for developing this neighborhood. It sure wasn't what I expected when I bought into the neighborhood. Um, and likewise, all of the other folks. Um, at business at hand, you have options in front of you. And I, I looked through, I read through all the options quick. Um, I failed to see that option two had any recommendation. Um, maybe I'm just unable to read, but I, I don't think there's a recommendation in number two. Um, I did feel like the comments made by my neighbors um, two weeks ago was uh, kind of, what they were after was something like uh, option number four, to create an overlay zone district. Ms. Nance, your time has come to a close, if you can wrap up. Okay, that that, that was what was, we thought it was safe, we thought the neighborhood was protected, um, but that zoning, a change that change made four years ago uh, that allowed subdivisions has unprotected it. And so we appreciate the council's effort last week and we'll try to work this out. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Greg v Veter. Thank you. I'm Greg Veter, 4181 Everett Drive. And my comments are about the neighborhood revitalization strategy process. Uh, I was at a meeting at the rec center on the 30th, and uh, it was my first time at such a meeting. Um, and uh, I and a couple other people in the room, my wife, we wanted to know more about the uh, revitalization strategy group and what all is going on. We were given a quick overview, and then we were told that we had to participate in two hypothetical situations, which effectively was a, um, 
it, it was a hijack of our time because we were um, not getting into what's really taking place in the Wheat Ridge re revitalization. It seemed like a, a pretense at um, having an open discussion when we were really prevented from a, uh, asking about the details of the NRS. And so my concern is to try to get the uh, meetings that t do take place to be open for uh, a uh, review of all of what's going on in terms of the topics, the tangents, the nature of the discussions, and the nature of the back and forth, and which we weren't given then, but sought. Um, and I would suggest that that kind of general information be part of your plan discussions and not do um, group exercises like hypotheticals. Um, and I gather tonight that all the commentary is going to be made and then the, the, those of us that are not a part of the circle in the middle um, are out of the discussion. Is that part correct? That's correct. Okay. Then how will the um, our reactions or thoughts to the process that's taking place in the middle group be made available to you because so much of that's kind of live and in the present tense. You know, I, I uh, am interested to see how the discussion goes tonight, but we have another uh, six or eight months to discuss the NRS before mm -hmm. the report is done. So hopefully your comments today and public comment will spark some, uh, some more, uh, some more uh, different directions and, uh, and you will have an opportunity to have a more free-ranging discussion in the, in the process. Uh, that would be good because I'm my, I'd have to remember everything from one meeting to the next. I'm not sure that I'm that good at that. Um, so um, that would be a good idea. And uh, you know, the, uh, the committee is, and the members of the committee are always available, I believe, to, uh, to take comments and, and review those and I'm sure um, you know the written word is always uh, always forthcoming too. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the people that have signed up to speak tonight under public comment. Is there anyone else here in the in the room that that did not get a chance to sign up and would like to speak? You may do so now. I don't see anyone, so we will close public comment. And I thank you all for being here and speaking. Um, <clears throat> So we will go to our first item on the, uh, on the agenda. It's item number one, the Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Joint Meeting with Planning Commission. Uh, I appreciate all of the Planning Commissioners being here. And before we have a lot of, we have a lot of faces at the table. Uh, I've never faced, uh, faced so many in my life as a, yeah. as a chair of a meeting. But uh, why don't we go a a around and introduce myself. And I know the gentleman to my right, our city manager, if you would start the introductions. We'll go this way. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Patrick Goff, I'm city manager. Oh, and, and, and you need to get into a microphone and have it be green. Amanda Weaver, Planning Commissioner. Ken Johnstone, Director of Community Development. Alan Bucknam, District 1 Planning Commissioner. Emery Dorsey, Planning Commission. Janice Hoppe, District 1 City Council Member. Zachary Urban, District 2. Dan Larson, Planning Commission, District 4. Please Matthews, uh, City Council District Four. Thank you. Tim Fitzgerald, City Council District Three. Yeah. Scott Ohm, Planning Commissioner District Two. Janet Leo, Planning Commissioner District Four. George Pond, Council District Three. Leah Dozman, Council Member District Four. Vivian Voss, District Two, Planning Commission. Richard Peterson, District 1, Planning Commission. Eric Amy, CZB, Consultant. Mike Byrne, MJB Consulting, Retail Consultant. Thomas, Thomas Eddington, CZB. And I'm Bud Starker, I'm the mayor. Only the first names will be on the exam. So anyway, thank you all for joining us. Um, 
I'm going to go to Mr. Goff because he's my go-to guy to tell us how we're going to organize this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll be brief um, so we can get going. But uh, tonight we're here um, with our consultants. They introduced themselves already to uh, provide a, a midterm update on the NRS process and to obtain feedback and comments from both City Council and Planning Commission. Thank you very much, Planning Commission, for being here. Um, uh, we're looking for feedback and comments on the information that you, that's going to be presented to you this evening. Um, as, as you all know, or most of you should know, City Council appointed an NRS steering committee earlier this year to help facilitate an update to the 2005 process. The committee has been meeting since July. Um, they've had three um, all committee or full committee meetings and, um, and many, many small group meetings uh, throughout the community. Um, you've, you've heard from a, a couple of the steering committee meetings but, or uh, members, but I think there's a few others. Could, could you stand up if you're on the committee just so we could recognize you? And thank you that we have a few here. Thank you. Um, Rachel Holtine and Sunny um, Bentacourt are the co-chairs of the committee. They weren't uh, required to be here tonight. They're, they're so busy um, holding community meetings. We didn't um, um, ask them to uh, have to be here this evening. Uh, because tonight's meeting is really about, about YouTube, about the Planning Commission and the City Council, this is going to be a focus group meeting um, with, with both of these boards. Uh, we really want to hear from you as representatives of the community. Um, we are not looking for policy decisions this evening. Um, rather, we want a robust discussion about um, the information that's going to be presented to you this evening. Um, we expect that there's going to be disagreement with some of the things you may hear tonight. And we want to talk through that. We want to, we want to understand why you may disagree or why you may agree with that. Um, is the NRS uh, update proceeding in the right direction? What are we getting right and what are we getting wrong? So um, with that, I'm just going to turn it over. And also, maybe to respond to Mr. Veter's comment, I think Ken grabbed him on the way out. But, um, and I think Eric will probably maybe get to the, the, the steps ahead. But we do have a public meeting. Um, scheduled for December 10th, um, so that will be an opportunity for more dialogue and, uh, and opportunities for um, the public to comment um, in more general general manner. Um, and there will be more opportunities besides December 10th. So, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Amy, and he will um, start start his going. I believe, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Um, again, my name is Eric Amy. I'm from a firm called CZB. We are an Alexandria, Virginia-based um, urban planning and neighborhood revitalization consulting firm. There are uh, five of us. Two of us are here tonight. Thomas Eddington over here is uh, with my colleague from CZB. And we are joined by Mike Byrne from MJB Consulting. And the way this usually works is that we do a lot of the, the housing and, and residential side, a lot of the demographic data and Mike brings the retail expertise. So um, we're going to tag team it tonight. Uh, Mike has a lot of interesting things to say. Well, we hope we all have interesting things to say, but some of the most fun stuff is his. Um, there we go. Yeah. Is it possible to lower the lights? Yeah, we'll get the videographer. Yep, there we go. How's that? Can everyone see that? Good? Okay. Again, to you know, reiterate Patrick's um, thanks, I know this is a, um, an uncommon event to have um, the council and the commission together. We really appreciate the time, uh, the time that you give anyway, but certainly the time you give um, together. So this is, a, as everyone has, has noted tonight, an important process. Um, a lot of uh, big things potentially to be worked out uh, through this process. I don't know that we will solve everything uh, and, and nail down every single issue facing Wheat Ridge, but uh, we'll do our best on many of the most important ones. Tonight, what we're trying to accomplish is uh, to give you some of the project basics. It's been, for those of you who remember, I think I was in the same chair about seven months ago. It seems like it was only yesterday, but it was seven months ago, so we've not been back since then. So we want to bring you up to speed um, on council. For those of you on Planning Commission, this information might be uh, very new to you. So we just want to make sure everybody's sort of on the same page on the basics as a starting point. And that will include a little bit about where this project came from, what the process is, what the timing is, all those things. Some questions have been raised tonight, so we'll do our best to answer those um, at least at a high level. Second, uh, the main event is we want to share our preliminary observations. Um, 
what we tend to do is, as consultants is it's our responsibility to crunch the numbers, to look at the data, to make the maps, all that kind of stuff. And we often rely on our steering committee um, members in Wheat Ridge and, and other communities to help us with the qualitative data. So we can tell you what the numbers say. What we cannot tell you is, is what your own community says, what your neighbors say, what your constituents say, what your voters say. And so um, any, no matter how skilled we are as public engagement specialists, we're never going to get to as many people or bring the perspective that uh, our steering committee members can bring. So luckily this time we have 26 of them and, and um, they're doing a great job, as you heard a little bit about. We'll talk about that. But what we're really here tonight to talk about from our side is, is the data. And then the, the main point, though, and what we will not be successful tonight if we don't get from all of you around this table is sort of your feedback, your thoughts. Um, as, as Patrick said, you are a focus group of sorts, but you are a focus group with uh, more responsibility than the average person in Wheat Ridge. Uh, you'll be your policymakers, um, deciders on key issues, uh, big and small. And so this work, we expect, will end up back in your laps in some form or fashion down the line. And what we really feel is important is to get some sort of um, guardrails or parameters. Um, if we have a sense of what the folks around this table are thinking and feeling about the information that we are sharing, or even about things that we maybe aren't bringing to this conversation, that really helps us shape the direction. So uh, it's not maybe going to be the case that we're going to get clear direction on, we really don't like this, or we really want that. Um, it's, it's, that's probably not realistic. but. Um, these are the settings where those kinds of responses can help us shape direction going forward. And again, as Patrick said, we are not solving any problems here tonight. There are nobody's has to put their hand in the air. Uh, there's no, uh, there are no votes. There's no, we don't have to come to consensus on anything. This is about getting issues out on the table, making sure they are the right ones. So we are hoping for um, a lively discussion. We're hoping for. Uh, lots of opinions to come out, and without any pressure, feeling like we've got to fix anything. Just briefly, the, uh, I know some of you are aware, some of you may not be, that uh, the first neighborhood revitalization strategy was completed back in the 2003, 2004, 2005 timeframe. I believe that project was led by uh, Winston Associates from Boulder. And our firm was a partner on that project. Uh, Tom, Thomas and I weren't around back then, but our colleague Charles was, and he did a lot of that work that's in that document. Um, and, and the long and the short of it was, um, you know, Wheat Ridge was a different place 13 years ago, 15 years ago than it is today, obviously. Um, but it was struggling to compete. It was, um, you know, the infrastructure was aging. Uh, it wasn't occupying a, sort of a prime spot in the market in the Denver metro region. And that process and that, that document were aimed toward improving Wheat Ridge's competitive position. There's been 13 years since that, the adoption of that document and now. Um, things are very different. The region has changed. Wheat Ridge has changed. Some of those things were, um, for good or for bad, were outside the control of anybody here. Um, some of those things that were good uh, were within the control of people in this room things like the establishment of uh, what's now called local works, um, economic development efforts, uh, parks and rec and open space efforts, uh, a lot of things that happened here that were good. Uh, the market also has changed. There, I, I wasn't around back then, but I assume that um, uh, West 38th didn't look the way it does today, didn't have the businesses that it has today. Uh, there was no luckies, right? So a lot of things have, have evolved in a good way. The way this project is structured uh, is, that's not a hierarchy diagram, it's just sort of us sitting in the middle of a bunch of people who tell us what to do, but, <laughs> which is how most projects work. Uh, we take input from um, the staff, from the steering committee, uh, from the two bodies that are here tonight. Uh, we plan to be back, this is not our last visit with you, we hope, uh, we'd like to come back once per phase so that we have a series of check-in points so that we're, again, staying within those guardrails once we figure out what they are, not going off track, getting your feedback at, at key points. Uh, and then our steering committee is meeting more regularly than that. We, I think, we've, as Patrick said, we've had three meetings 
um, three meetings, and we will meet with them again uh, a number, handful of times, as well as sort of interim check-ins with uh, co-chairs and, and smaller groups of subcommittees of the steering committee. So we're, as I said, we're being directed by quite a few folks. And that's good, by the way, because it helps us really sort of keep a pulse on, on what's, you know, the, the opinions and the feelings are in Wheat Ridge. The more people that we can talk to, the more people that give their input directly to us, the better we think we can do our job. Uh, this is the, we talked about the steering committee really doing a lot of the heavy engagement work. I remember ba being back here just after Easter in the spring and sitting, I think, in this exact chair describing this process. The mayor sitting in that chair saying, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to be on that committee. And uh, maybe some of the <laughs> that was some other mayor. That wasn't this mayor. Um, I, I hope that, and it is a lot of work, and our steering committee members who are here tonight could attest to that, but it sounds like um, they're not ready to run away yet and that they're enjoying it, so we, we appreciate that. There will be uh, additional engagement opportunities, so let me go here for a second. If you can see this diagram, um, we're sort of at the end of phase one right now, and phase one is really the warm-up, the, the committee, the getting to know you committee phase, the beginnings of the public engagement work. Um, our analysis, which we're going to discuss tonight. And so the first phase is really kind of the getting all the, everything organized, getting all the pieces in the right place uh, before we get to the heart of the matter. And the point in saying that is to remind everybody that um, we're not near the end. We're, much, we're closer to the beginning than we are to the end. And that we have additional engagement opportunities, both targeted and small and also large and wide open. And so as Patrick said, we, for instance, we've got a December open house coming up. It's not the 10th, it's the 12th. So uh, we'll let the record reflect. It is uh, the 12th of December and we will begin um, publicizing that and getting the details out uh, very quickly. In fact, some people in this room are reviewing a flyer tonight to make sure that we have got all the information correct and we'll start getting that out uh, very soon, probably before this week is out. So that'll be city website, uh, local media, social media, all those things. And uh, we will have more of those, uh, at least one in may, probably in the late winter and perhaps another one in the spring. So again, we're just sort of getting started now and more is to come. Uh, before, just a couple more notes about tonight. The, we have a, a lot of stuff to share. Um, the document you all got, and by the way, if you would like sort of a nicer, better copy, um, Lauren has a stack of bound copies of this interim document. If you'd like one, you can just give her the signal and she'll, she'll bring one over to you. Um, but there's a lot, and, and there's a lot that didn't even make it in there. Um, we didn't want to run you through 300 slides. We didn't think that that was going to go very well. Um, there's not enough coffee in this room to make that happen. And so our plan is really to give you a very high level sort of executive summary run through of the key things that we want to focus on and talk about. And then as you have questions and comments, uh, we will navigate our way to, to the right slides um, as we need to. So, when we get to the end, in a couple of minutes, uh, Mike and I, when we get to the, the end of our sort of formal presentation, that's not it. We're just waiting for you to ask us more questions, just so you know. Okay. I wanted to share this because um, there's, it often comes a point in, in any project that we do where People sort of ask the question, wait, what are we doing this for again? Especially if they don't like where it's going. And so we just want to uh, raise specifically, explicitly, sort of call out um, the key assumptions in revitalization work. So a key assumption in revitalization work is that the status quo isn't good enough, that things are not perfect the way they are, that change is required, and that that change is a stronger market, that there's more demand flowing into Wheat Ridge more demand in terms of population growth, more households, uh, more households with higher income, with higher spending power, ability to pay more in rent, pay more for a house, pay more for a cup of coffee, or for you know, um, whatever it might be. Those are the things, the, uh, the, the strengthening market is what will uh, help achieve the ends that people often say they want to achieve. And that that change means change. 
there, we have not, in our professional experience, yet found um, that magic bullet that lets everybody get what they want, but nothing has to be different in order to achieve that. So, for instance, um, we want everybody to have a nice house. We want everybody to do to to their house to look nice, but we don't want any code enforcement. We don't want to spend any money on incentive programs. We don't want any uh, new people moving in who are going to change the house. We just want it to be the way we want it to be, and we don't we want to avoid any costs. And we haven't found that yet. Um, there's just there's kind of there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch, and. We, I came across this, the strangest thing in the city that we were working in in the Great Lakes, we call it the Industrial Great Lakes region, I'll leave it unnamed for now. But there were actually a group of academics, and this is a city who's in, is in bad, bad shape. Um, there were a group of academics who said, we don't want revitalization. What you call revitalization, we call undesirable neighborhood change. So we don't want the houses to go up in value, we don't want any new restaurants to open in the neighborhood, we just want it to be left alone because if anything changes, then that will be some disruption to somebody's life in that neighborhood, and that is our, um, that's the most important thing to us. And we said, okay, that's not what the mayor says, but we can respect that. Really quickly, uh, our, our overall market uh, assessment, I also want to say at the outset, a lot of the things that Mike and I are going to talk about tonight are generalizations, okay? There are going to be exceptions to everything we say, and we'll talk about those. You may have questions about those. Um, we'll volunteer them at certain points. But because we're trying to move quickly and because we're trying to get to sort of the 80-20 of this, we're going to be a bit general. Don't hesitate to ask us questions about those exceptions if, as you think that they might exist. So the generalizations, um, Wheat Ridge uh, is a place of relative to the region, relative to its competition in the western part of the metro. It's got lower incomes. It is uh, lower levels of education, particularly uh, college graduates. Uh, it's got older residents. Its built form is aging and messy. Um, it's just, it's, the infrastructure is old. Uh, as Rachel was talking about, the housing is old. Um, the buildings are date to a time when they weren't necessarily built to last anyway. Uh, it's, and this is not a Wheat Ridge specific problem. This is something that exists in a lot of communities in America, but it is true here. Um, that being said, Wheat Ridge does also have locational advantages. You know, you're sitting in some pretty prime, prime real estate uh, along I-70 between Denver and the mountains. There are many places that for whatever challenges Wheat Ridge might have, a lot of places said, well, I'd like to be sitting where Wheat Ridge is sitting, right? That looks pretty good to me. We will elaborate on all of these. The implications for that uh, is a general lack of new housing investment. Uh, older, smaller homes may, or may turn to rental. Obsolete structures in good locations are facing redevelopment pressure. And existing commercial areas lack enough fuel to redevelop in the way that we might like. Why it matters. So this might, if, this might seem obvious, but sometimes it's not obvious to certain audiences. Um, the housing market matters for a few reasons. It determines who lives in Wheat Ridge, right? Uh, supply and demand shapes your community. For instance, if um, Mike and his wife uh, want a, a one-bedroom condo on the 12th floor of a high-rise, right? And Mike and his wife would be fantastic residents to have because Mike coaches youth basketball and his wife is a music teacher, right? And wouldn't we love to have them um, in our community? They'd be great contributors, but we don't have a one-bedroom condo on the 12th floor of a high-rise, so we're not going to get Mike and his wife, right? Um, maybe I want a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath place that was built in the last five years. That's hard to find in Wheat Ridge, right? Maybe so I can't, I can't be there. But who will accept the housing that you have or who does want the housing that you have, right? You may have, um, anyway, so I think you get the point. Uh, neighborhood quality of life, properties and their condition influence life in ways big and small. Uh, we, we all spend a lot of time at home, a lot of time in our yard, a lot of time on our block. If it looks and feels good, we feel good. And if it doesn't, we're cranky, right? Image and community pride, we like, pe we like to feel like we live in a nice place. Uh, we like other people to think that we live in a nice place. This is something we sense is quite important in Wheat Ridge, as it is in many other places. 
um, and fiscal impacts. Uh, recognizing that Wheat Ridge doesn't have a particularly huge chunk of its budget coming from property tax, the reality is that housing is a, is a dominant land use in any community, and um, it is your property tax base. And if you are heavier on sales tax, the people who live in those houses or in those uh, apartments or condos, they are your local shoppers, right? And what they buy and how much they buy uh, determines sort of whether you guys can balance the books or whether you can't. A few things that are more specifically to keep in mind, uh, and none of these should be surprises, I don't think, but relative lack of new product is an issue in Wheat Ridge. Uneven standards of care. Uh, there are not all of Wheat Ridge, again, the generalizations versus the exceptions. Not all of Wheat Ridge has this, but it's, there are places that it's a bit rough around the edges, and uh, many buyers would think twice about, do I want to be on this block, right? I'm looking at this house over here, but this house next to it looks like the lawn has been mowed, you know, recently. This place next to, on the other side, looks like it needs a coat of paint. Somebody didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? You know, is that going to be my neighbor for the next two years, the next 20 years? What am I really getting into here? Something I think we'll spend some time on tonight about uh, your, your housing stock, particularly your single family detached housing stock, which is older and quite frankly is not um, particularly desirable in the buyer market in 2018. And there's evidence to suggest that not all of it, not today, not tomorrow, but uh, it is trending toward being more of a rental stock. So I want to talk about that. And as we, you know, the conversation that preceded this, well, at least the, the number of speakers that preceded this conversation tonight, um, there, there, because the land is valuable in Wheat Ridge and, and getting more and more valuable, there is going to be redevelopment pressure. And whether you don't have a lot of land here in Wheat Ridge that doesn't have something on it. And so uh, the places that are you know, going to be uh, facing redevelopment pressure do have something on it. And the places where that's going to happen are where the structures are m sort of most ready to go, to leave, to be done. Um, a lot of structures that are beyond their useful life, a lot of structures that are not particularly marketable um, in this current day and age. And so uh, that's going to continue to be the case as long as uh, demand to be in the Denver region is high. Again, we're flying through this stuff. We're, we'll come back and talk about all these points. So I'm going to turn over to Mike now and let him talk about some of the retail findings. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, actually, do I need the clicker? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's the mouse? Yeah, the mouse. That should work. Okay. Okay. Is this the first slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so for the purposes of this discussion here tonight, um, I want to discuss two reasons why retail is such an important land use, right? Um, and, and why it plays such a critical role in, in the neighborhood revitalization strategy. One, um, given the way Colorado's tax regime works, Sa retail is one of your primary generators uh, of sales tax revenue, and sales tax revenue looms very large in how much money you have as a municipality. And the largest generators uh, of sales tax revenue with individual, within individual municipalities um, are, with some notable exceptions, like Applejack, for instance, often larger format chains. Right? Um, which focus on the mass market rather than a specific niche. Right? And in a car-dominated setting like Wheat Ridge, which accommodate the motorist in their design and orientation. Um, so for the purposes of talking about sales tax generation, I'm going to focus on those sorts of retailers. Not as a value judgment about which ones, uh, about whether I am advising more of those for Wheat Ridge or less, but rather just to state a fact that they, they do tend to generate um, the, the lion's share of sales tax revenue um, in individual municipalities. Um, now, that said, generating sales tax revenue is not the only role that retail plays, right? Um, if you think about it, 
Retail is the land use that one can most easily see and assess, right? Um, if you visit an area you've never been to before, you don't know what's going on upstairs. Um, you probably aren't driving the side streets, but you can see the retail at ground level, right? You can see when there are vacancies, you can see when there are tenants, and you can see which tenants those are. And you will, for better or for worse, draw conclusions about the place you're driving through based on what retail you do and do not see. Right? That's just human nature. In this vein, then, retail can have a much broader impact than just generating sales tax revenue. Right? As one of the key ingredients in the creation of a distinctive, walkable place that not only improves the quality of life of inhabitants, of current residents, but also helps to attract new ones, um, as well as draw the attention of investors more generally. And this is what I call placemaking retail. Okay, um, and placemaking retail is very different from sales tax generating retail in this very simplistic dichotomy. Right? Um, they tend to be unique concepts rather than mass market ones. Uh, they're either independently owned or they're smaller chainlets as opposed to anywhere USA chains. Right? They include eateries, brew pubs, coffee houses, as well as boutiques and they occupy storefronts that are flush with the sidewalk rather than set back behind parking lots. You think of districts like Tennyson Road or Old Town Arvada or Downtown Louisville. That's what I'm talking about. That's placemaking retail. That has played a critical role in creating and reinforcing that distinctive walkable place. Right? So those are the two types of retail that I want to focus on. Right? This is weird. Go left and it goes up. Okay, anyway, I digress. Um, <clears throat> so let's first talk about sales tax revenue generation. All right? Now, the reality, in as much as we're talking about larger format chains, there are fewer larger format chains that are even expanding these days. As you all know and read ad nauseum in newspapers, uh, online competition has disrupted a number of categories which have been relied upon in the past for sales tax revenue, specifically ones dominated by what are called category killers. I'm not joking, that's what they're called. Category killers are basically medium or big box stores that sell one type of merchandise, but they sell a really broad selection and at generally low prices. Right? And if you think about it, these were dominant in the 1990s and the aughts, right? Um, uh, whether it was Barnes & Noble, uh, whether it was Best Buy, uh, whether it was Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Um, whether it was Home Depot, these were all called category killers. Well, if you think about category killers, right? They generate a lot of sales tax revenue, but what do they trade on? Why do you shop there? Well, you usually shop there for two reasons. Selection, which is usually very broad, and convenience. The internet does both of those things much, much better, right? So as a result, most of the um, uh, bankruptcies and liquidations in retail these last few years, the so-called retail apocalypse that you undoubtedly read a lot about, most of those, um, a lot of those were category killers, right? If you think about it, we no longer have borders. We no longer have linens and things. We no longer have Circuit City. We no longer have Sports Authority. We no longer have Toys R Us. All category killers, right? And even the ones that have remained have reduced their footprints, right? So that source, that one-time source of sales tax generation, much reduced, right? But it's not just that, okay? We all, we all have heard the story about e-commerce. There's something else going on here, too. Um, the mass market position in Wheat Ridge, kind of the bulge in the demand, if you want to say, is low to middle, right? That's reflected in the current mix of deep discount offerings and mainstream staples, right? So, um, and, and to some degree, this understates its demographics, right? Um, and that there should be the potential to elevate the mix to be more in line with those demographics. The problem, though, is that what do you elevate 
lower middle to. Well, the next level becomes middle to upper middle, right? And that's become much more challenging in recent decades. Because Ecuadorian trades in the broader economy, um, retail has increasingly bifurcated, right, into two tiers, high and low. And middle has mostly been fading from view, right? This has been most evident in the struggles of mid-market chains, proliferation of dollar stores, growth in off-price fashion, you know, TJ Maxx, Ross Dress for Less, broader receptiveness to secondhand and consigned goods, right? High and low, the middle has been fading from view. And in as much as that's that next level to which wheat ridges mix could rise, and there's fewer actually, actual retailers at that level expanding, that means our pool is still smaller, right? So taken together, these two trends mean a shrinking pool of expansion-minded retailers. And of the ones that are still looking to grow, they're mostly considering the A-plus submarkets and A-plus locations, the larger and more established shopping destinations. Unsure of what the future holds, they're hesitant to take chances. So the opportunities for the kinds of uh, big and medium box shopping centers that developers were building from the early 1990s to as late as 2008, and that frankly, West, that Wheat Ridge itself once envisioned at Clear Creek Crossing, see in that picture, those opportunities are now few and far between. The one opportunity that does present itself for that is at Applewood Village and Clear Creek Crossing. Now the A-plus A location in this sub-market is not there. It's actually Colorado Mills, Denver, West Village. Right? But there are few opportunities there for larger format retailers um, to find space. Right? Moreover, both the lease rates and the taxes are higher there. Um, and any retailers that have yet to find space at Colorado Mills or Denver West Village, they could be intrigued by available floor plates just one exit away along I-70. So that's, that's the one exception. Um, why is this not working now? Okay. Okay, so those are just a few comments on sales tax generation. Let's get to this issue of placemaking retail. Where is the potential for that in Wheat Ridge? Well, there's no doubt growing demand for that in Wheat Ridge, um, but it is still modest. For one thing, Wheat Ridge is still overwhelmingly auto-oriented, and there is as yet not much of a precedent for walkable retail. Change of this sort occurs over time as a series of evolutionary phases. It does not happen overnight. Right? So for that reason, we're thinking, um, and, and then the second part of this as well, <clears throat> is that not only is the demand modest, but also the supply in the sense that retailers themselves, the kinds of placemaking retailers that I was describing earlier, those unique independents, chainlets, right? Um, they tend to require certain types of space. They need that usually they can only afford the cheaper rents of, of second generation or older buildings, right? Or if it's new construction, it needs to be a landlord that actually sees the value of perhaps taking a hit on the ground floor. Um, maybe so as to drive premiums for the other uses in his project, right? Um, so, it re so those sorts of retailers require very specific circumstances. So then not only is the demand still modest, but also um, the retailers that correspond to place making really need very specific sorts of circumstances. So for this reason, we're concluding for now that there's room for just one compact place here in Wheat Ridge, right? But why am I, why am I saying one, uh, one, one rather, than, um, rather than two? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> um, now, if there is gonna be just one compact place, we think that focus should be, as it has been, on West 38th a relatively compact area from, say, up to Reed, right? Um, because this stretch already has some historic fabric, right? And it has already welcomed a handful of place-making businesses in recent years, like Wright Coast, or Colorado Plus, or Bardo Coffee House, right? Now, Wadsworth, on the other hand, is a different story, right? There, you're really starting from square one in terms of creating a walkable place. 
The zoning currently requires that the sidewalks be lined with zero or shallow setback storefronts that are flush with or close to the sidewalk. And, and that, that makes all the sense in the world and should be required on streets that already have established streams of foot traffic. The problem is that right now, retailers are not going to want to locate on Wadsworth for the foot traffic because the foot traffic simply does not exist yet. It's kind of a chicken or the egg problem. Right? The kinds of retailers that would want to locate on a Wadsworth are the ones that trade primarily on convenience for motorists. Right? And they would likely pass on zero or shallow setback storefronts because those sorts of storefronts, if you think about it, the design alters the sight lines from the road in such a way as to reduce the window during which their store can hope to capture the attention of fast moving motorists. Cars, driving by at a certain speed, if they're driving faster, there's less of a, of a likelihood that they're actually going to see the sign. There's more. Now, if you set it back, then there's more time for them to see the sign. And that's why so many suburban, uh, so much suburban retail is set back, right? Um, so while I understand and would strongly encourage beautification efforts along Wadsworth, walkable retail there is a bit of a sticky wicket. Again, given that there is room for just one compact place, I would rather put my eggs in the West 38th basket. So I'll leave you with that and trust that you'll have input to provide and questions to ask. And right now we'll cede the floor back to Eric. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so just to conclude this part where we talked the whole time, um, just to sum it up, and this is, a, the, I think, the, the end of your um, the document, the, the send ahead, the interim report. There are a few things that, again, we're not solving anything tonight, but there are a few things we want to um, sort of uh, plant in your heads and in anybody's head who's part of this project going forward um, as to what the, f the future of this work will be about. One is that addressing sort of the market weakness and the challenges that that come from that, uh, because the market's not going to be able to do it on its own, is going to require some public investment, st strategic public investment. And not like little bits of money, but fairly significant investments. And those investments will be, um, they'll be public and private, but there will be a lot of sort of priming the pump type expenditures from city government. And those will come in the forms of, um, uh, sort of direct spending on things that are public, uh, such as infrastructure, and then also incentives to facilitate uh, getting some of the things that the city might want. It won't, it won't come cheap. So we just want to, as Rachel uh, pointed out, sort of there's a trade-off for everything. I guess that's the general theme here. Uh, the, the challenge of housing investment, the reality being that um, a lot of new housing investment is going to come in existing existing neighborhoods, not in a cornfield somewhere far away, um, but you know on your street, on your block, maybe next to your house, um, changing a structure that someone's lived next to for 25, 30, 40 years. It's a big amount of change, but that is going to likely characterize a lot of the the future housing investment that we were just likely to see. The trade-off for that is it's the character question, right? Um, I like my block the way it looks. I like my street the way it looks. I like my entire city the way it looks. I don't want it to change. Trade off again. And these are questions. These are not sort of statements of conclusion. That there's a need for higher standards. Uh, so to, to the extent that there are things that um, a city can do, like code enforcement, enforcement of standards, um, that's a, that's a sort of a big government function, right? And um, some places just say, we don't really want to get into it. it sounds hard. It's politically unpopular. Um, I don't like it when someone comes to my house and tries to tell me what to do, right? So th there's a question there, a uh, choice to be made over time about how much regulation, how much do we tell people how to live on their own property, right? And all of this adds up to just, you know, eventually, uh, again, we're not to solutions, but eventually making big changes uh, requires some real costs. And the question becomes for uh, policymakers and for the community at large, 
are the benefits worth the costs? So if my taxes go up, um, if the code enforcement officer comes by and says I can't you know, have that car sitting up on blocks in my driveway for the sixth month, um, is that an acceptable cost to get a community I feel better about, a community that has better retail offerings, um, that has better looking corridors, where I myself can be assured that my neighbor also can't leave his car up on blocks for the sixth month, right? These are the things I wanna get, and am I willing to pay, to pay the cost there? Um, financial, political, all those things. So that's sort of what we wanna close with, um, and then we will, from there, sort of open it up to your questions, your, your feedback, um, your responses to, to any and all of what we've had to say. All right, thank you very much. Well, we've opened it, opened it for questions. Um, who would like to start? Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, some of the questions that when I was looking through the data that I had, um, I didn't see where what we already have and whether it's working or not was identified. And so will that be uh, part of this process? Um, and an example would be um, public investment in our aging uh, commercial uh, storefront infrastructure we have the Wheat Ridge Business District that um, offers um, facade update sign grants, so free money. So that's, is that something that will be in, in part of this process will be reviewed and then will there be a, a report card, so to say, that that is working or is not working? We're not, in this project, we're not really um, evaluating the, the effectiveness of everything that's been done to date on the issues that have been previously identified. But certainly, we, uh, when we get to the certain point of, of re making recommendations about uh, what are the interventions that will actually you know, help and that the city should more robustly fund or create you know, from whole cloth or whatever it might be, that we'll certainly be referencing existing stuff. Yes. Yeah, and you know, in and, and, and as much a, as um, commercial uh, retail is concerned, um, you know, that slide where I say, you know, placemaking retail, um, the retailers themselves tend to materialize only in specific circumstances, like if it's a you know, second generation space or uh, if there's a, you know, a landlord that's willing to take a hit in the ground floor rent. The other piece of that is if there is assistance available. And from what I understand, Wright Coast, when they bought that building, there was such assistance that they availed themselves of, and, and that's that 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 was essential uh, to making that happen. So uh, that those are that's also a specific circumstance that could help that placemaking retail along. Um, so certainly be uh, saying you know commenting to that extent. But as for the efficacy of, of programs, specific programs, that's, that's a little more. Ms. Hoppy, please. I just wanted to follow up real fast and say that um, one of the programs that Wright Coast does take advantage of is still offered through Local Works, and that's the bu Building Up Business uh, Loan Program for anyone who's listening. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. One thing I'd like to say straight up is I appreciate, appreciate always hearing the truth. If we have warts, we need to know about it. If we have um, really great things happening, we need to know how we got to that point also. But um, we will never progress unless we deal from facts and, and the truth. And so I appreciate your um, disclaimers, <laughs> but that you're making generalities. Some of them we already realized, but they need to be, they need to be brought out for sure. Um, one of the questions uh, I had, and this is probably getting a little bit more specifics, but what's hard for me to reconcile is, for instance, our, our older, smaller homes. We, we, in, in one 
breath, we're told we need more affordable housing. And one, we're told that nobody wants the older, smaller homes, which I look at as kind of our affordable starter house, starter home market. About um, three years ago, a retail, uh, a realtor sat over there and said, we read you have to give me more $300,000 homes to sell because I can sell them in three days. And our older, smaller homes are becoming $300,000 homes. <laughs> so how do we reconcile the need for affordable housing with our existing stock versus tearing stuff down and building up? And that's, that's a catch-22 for me, at least, is a lot of people come and look and see these little small bungalows are really pretty. And maybe they've got established landscaping and 30-foot high trees and all that. So where do you, how do you cut that baby in half? That's going to be a question that we all have to address. That and when it comes to changing in the neighborhoods, uh, it's also the price of change uh, if you take a $200,000 fixer upper and tear it down, someone's gonna wanna put a $500,000 house in its place and now you no longer have the same neighborhood or the affordable housing. And the other thing I'm gonna come back to, I'll give you some time to think about that. We've done nothing but go in the wrong direction towards, and I don't know if this is the time, but we've done nothing but go in the wrong direction towards increasing the amount of rentals we have in this house. I mean, in this uh, this city, I looked at one of your graphs there, and it's just gone up in every category: big houses, little houses, whatever. Rental has increased, and we're at 50 percent or, or over now. And that is everything that's happened, both in old homes and new, and new construction. How do we? And your last, the last NRS said we had to stop doing that, and we haven't since 2005. How do we reconcile that? You have suggest subjections, sub suggestions or advice on what do we have to do what hard how do you make those hard decisions to say okay mm -hmm. either we're going to be downtown denver that's a rental market or we're going to stay wheat rich is is there a sense around this table that uh that larry's sentiment is shared that um the uptick in, in rental properties is potentially e either problematic very much so, or potentially problematic. Wasabi. Um, one of the things that I saw, I work, I was on the board of directors for Wheat Ridge 2020 when we had money from the um, CBDG funds from the county to purchase homes and um, make changes into them to things like the roof, the furnace, the windows, um, to make them <clears throat> more. Um, energy efficient and also these are the expensive changes that make it hard for people to a if they own the home but they don't want to put any money into it then they certainly don't want to put a new furnace or a new roof on it and then it turns into a rental so the, the homes that we purchased to do that to were rental homes and they were converted into home ownership um, the hard part was that the 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 money it takes to convert some of these rentals into into something that's a home owned product that somebody wants to own is where I see the disconnect in what's happening in our community. So a lot of people are finding that it's, it's too expensive for them to um, fix up the home when they could just rent it the way it is. And um, then also they don't necessarily want to, um, they don't wanna have to fix it up to be able to sell it. And so that's kind of what I saw happening in there. But I do think that our rental stock is pretty significantly high, and I would like to see that come down a little bit. However, we don't. We also need. By saying that, I think that we also need high quality rental stock, which is something that we don't have a lot of. And therefore, some of our newer uh, projects that are coming in that have new newer rental stock are the higher quality rental stock that then are things that are more attractive to the uh, younger community members, is how I see that. So I'm not sure if you can see this picture, but um, 
I'm sort of increasingly convinced that uh, our job security for the next 30 years, Thomas and mine, is this house. Because nobody in America knows what to do with this house. This isn't Wheat Ridge, by the way. This is about 30 minutes from where your community development director grew up um, in Midland, Michigan. But there's a, these homes present uh, currently, I, I think, because no one knows what to do with them, it's a challenge, right? So they're not particularly attractive in the ownership market. Even as a, a, a first-time buyer who's looking to spend $300,000 in the Denver metro area says, are you serious? That's what I get for $300,000? Maybe I'll just keep renting, right? Or maybe I'll move to Des Moines, Iowa, where my $300,000 is gonna get me a really, really nice house. Um, so I'm not gonna break, Larry, I'm not gonna break my rule of, of no solutions tonight, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me on that. But I think that this is one of those things that you know, we're, we're really serious, and it sounds like you sort of agree that this is something we wanna keep on the table, that we need to figure something out for going forward um, from, a, from a policy level of just recognizing we've and, and um janice as you as you called out i think this was a this is not a new issue right this is something that we were just known about this is something that was called out in the in the first nrs 15 years ago so it's just it's not it's not solved yet it's not going to get solved in the short term um even though these properties weren't meant to be viable for a hundred years you're going to have some of you're going to have a lot of them hanging around 100 years after their construction date um, barring some unforeseen circumstances so whether they are um, some kind of ownership option that doesn't seem to present itself today or whether they become well-managed smaller rentals for people who don't want to live in four or five stories but they'd rather live uh, or, you know rent a place uh, with some grass uh, we don't know but this is whether it's Midland, Michigan, or, or Demo, you know, a third of Des Moines, Iowa looks like this too, right? Or it's Wheat Ridge. This is something that we're, we're working on all over the place. Mr. Fitzgerald. Just a couple of muses. Um, muses when, is Mike's department. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, this has to do with Mike too. So uh, when we were talking about supporting uh, businesses and business growth in Wheat Ridge through subsidies of one kind or another. One thing we have not done that is on the extreme, but we should all at least think about it, is uh, property banking. Uh, we have never bought property and held it for uh, turning it into a better use. So I think we should keep that in our mind as something that's a possibility. And then the other thing I want to say is, um, and I'm not offering a value judgment on this at all, but when we talk about affordable housing, um, we have to also balance that with the fact that in the original NRS, uh, some of our goals were to improve our demographics. And so what we wanted in, in the original NRS would have been to upgrade uh, those houses into three bedroom houses, um, maybe with new wiring and two bathrooms. So because what we're looking for is a young professional family with little kids. Um, so when we talk about affordable housing, we have to balance that against our other big goal of uh, improving demographics. So I just wanted to bring that up as a, an uncomfortable trade-off. Pardon me, Ms. Voss. Grab, 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 grab a mic and put a green light on. I know Thank how you. to do this. <laughs> Being a mortgage payer to a bank, I guess I'm owning my home, uh, which I totally disagree with. I have a real concern with banks anymore. So if it were up to me, 
I would never be a landlord of a home because you have all the responsibilities and you have all the um, cost of that. I would rather rent. I would rather rent a nice brick home that I know has been built well, nothing like that necessarily. And I think that picture there could be changed with some landscaping and some outdoor lighting and maybe less grass, a little more tree and all, and then you don't have to worry about what the house looks like. Also, too, you wonder what's underneath that, um, what do they call that? Um, La the, siding the siding that's put on there. Maybe there is something underneath there mm -hmm. that's of a better look, and you could remove that. But also in Des Moines, Iowa, my aunt and uncle lived most of their life in a house exactly like that. Most of their life in a house like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you, the more brick homes we have, this statement on page 10 about as the city largely missed out on new housing construction. New housing construction has had lawsuits thrown against it for the lack of its ability to hold its shape and not crack and not fall apart. So I'm not sure even now I would want a new home. I'll tell you for a fact, I would not want a new home. I'd buy a 60s home that was a brick and I knew that was well built. Thank you. So I'll leave it at that and other comments to follow. I'll go to Ms. Leo and I'll be back to you. Um, yes, I have a comment about the rentals. There are, is a lot of rental in Wheat Ridge. However, um, the people who rent still shop in Wheat Ridge. The taxes are still paid on the property. The big problem is the absentee owner is not taking care of the property. So it makes it a negative for rentals because they're usually not kept up. And I'm not talking about mowing the lawn, I'm talking about ownership responsibility. So people say, oh, there's a house on my street that's rented and you can tell it's rented because it's not kept up like the other houses. Well, that's not, the issue of renting the house, it's the absentee owner. So it, the people who live there, taxes are still paid, they still shop in the community, and if they're happy in the community, when they're ready to buy, they will probably buy in that community. So the negative is the um, absentee owner. Mr. Bucknam. Yeah, uh, first of all, I just wanna thank the consultants for this uh, interim report. It's given me a lot to think about. I have a whole lot of stuff I could talk about, but I want to stick with the, the ownership and affordability part of it for now. Um, I do think, I know in District 1 and District 2, there there's a lot of uh, rentals, and I think people who rent in Wheat Ridge are a very important part of the population, both economically and socially. I know over at Stevens Elementary, there's a highly mobile and transient student population uh, that's very important to the neighborhood. And I think that uh, we should do what we can to encourage uh, and support uh, those populations uh, as they face uh, uh, the economic challenges of trying to move up uh, economically and increase their economic mobility. Uh, so I do think rentals are part of an equation that we want to think about. Affordable housing, in terms of affordable home ownership, is also another part of that. Um, uh, something that I'm interested in exploring and interesting to seeing uh, what kind of data you folks might have would be any sort of study or analysis of encouragement of accessory dwelling units as maybe one solution to increasing density, especially when we talk about multi-generational housing, which in Wheat Ridge, when you have a population that's aging in place, uh, is very important, I think. Uh, I live on a block, uh, a two block area where uh, when we moved into the neighborhood 15, 18 years ago, we were the youngest people there by 30 years. Uh, we were basically the second people to, you know, to ever own this house that had been built. Most of our neighbors who still live there uh, are in their 80s um, and they like it there. And they, I'm sure they would love to have their children and their grandchildren living there too. Um, it would be interesting to see what sort of uh, 
what what other communities who have who have instituted accessory dwelling unit um, either incentives or accommodations in their zoning and policy uh, what that looks like in terms of economics how that has impacted the uh, uh, property tax the sales tax revenue uh, the demographics in general um, the other thing I'd like to uh, explore uh, along with uh, Ms. Leo's uh, comments about uh, property maintenance and rentals. Um, do we have examples from other municipalities that we could look at in terms of norms on property maintenance, uh, how, uh, how those standards uh, are typically enforced in places that are considered to have good property maintenance standards? Um, I'm not talking about necessarily HOAs, but uh, communities in general. So those are the comments I have on that. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Pond. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for everyone who spoke tonight also and uh, for the presentation. I, I, I don't know that I specifically have a question. I just want to react to a couple of things that have been said and, and maybe the some of the takeaways from the document. I think um, in some ways it's it's a sobering um, information that that Although we've worked very hard on on many things, there's still there's still things that, um, in the greater context of of where we're at and what we're struggling with, and some of of our kind of I guess infrastructure, it makes it it makes it difficult. And it was important to do this, I think, and I, and to me, it's highlighting some important things moving forward. I do think the rental and affordability is is an important topic. It's I suppose not surprise, not surprising based on the logic or, or the analysis of it that um, with the housing, the housing stock that we have, it kind of pushes it towards a rental um, uh, mix. And so one of the things that I think I support um, more than anything, and then an inference on the rest of it that I that I make, is the the support of incentivizing investment in, in, in property, investment in houses, investment, you know, um, in, in these things so that <clears throat> we're not continually, you know, falling, falling behind. I think some of the, some of the graphs that are most, no, you know, uh, stark on here are the age of housing across Wheat Ridge versus some of the other, some of the other neighboring communities. Um, somehow we have to figure out a way to support that, um, support our, our citizens in doing that more than anything. Whether the house ends up being a rental at, at, you know, at some point uh, or not. And, and I think there's value in, in, in conversion of rental properties into home ownership as was discussed in the previous document and, and brought up tonight. But I also think it's important for us to become flexible to see how our community is going to go, you know, live through the next several years as well and, and beyond. So I do think it has a lot to, to do with even some of the topics that were brought up as part of um, the next agenda item, which is <clears throat> the need for flexibility and how we look at um, some of these things moving forward and the, and the need for, you know, for that to, we may have to face some hard conversations about how you, Respect the the value and the history, you know, historic nature of some of these communities, but actually honor the the uh, property values, the the um, uh, the way to invest in the property so that it has long term value, both for the people who own it and for the community as a whole. Um, so just the fact that we had these two things on the agenda, I think, is is um, in some ways not surprising because we've been talking about this a lot, but also very telling that it's, it's important for us probably to flex through the next phases of this and understand how we're going to be bringing up the zoning and the flexibility of the zoning ordinances um, that will support the same type of investment, um, I think. So um, that's just um, my take. Thank you for work. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, one of the, I'd kind of like to move off the rentals. I think we've, we've addressed that a little bit, but feel free to come back. One thing that's um, I'm concerned about, and it's because I have such a difficult time myself as an elected official of keeping in touch with my constituents. Um, it's very hard to get feedback and I'm, I'm concerned that we may not 
I don't know if we're going to be able to assure ourselves that we have really reached a true cross section and, 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 uh, of our people. On our website tonight, as I was looking at that earlier, um, in, after you come to our home page and on these small screens, you see the mountain picture. And then under that, you have a middle section that says happening in Wheat Ridge. We have a picture there of a billboard vacancy. Um, we have happening in Wheat Ridge quick links icon on the city website, which I'm sure will help something. It's nice to know we have that as far as how to get a hold of departments in the city. We have coffee with the mayor, and we have Wheat Ridge poet and residents that we're looking for a, a poet. I would sure have liked to have seen NRS maybe replace that billboard. Um, th I think this meeting tonight, if someone's going to open the website as they scroll down to get to the calendar, I'd like to have that have seen that come up. So I'm concerned about are we how are we reaching out to the folks and how are they finding us? Because I, I know it's difficult, and I'm not pointing any fingers here per se. I'm just saying, if there's got to be one huge effort to this whole thing, it's to get a hold of as many people as possible. I want I wanted to ask a, a little something um, about process. I was um, I, Mr. Vitor, one of our last speakers up at the podium uh, under under public comment, um, was concerned about the. The, the prompts and the, you know, that that the meeting he went to, I guess we had a couple of exercises and and I think consultants are great and I'm going to say some bad things about consultants, but I think overall you guys did a great job on this report and you do, you do great work. Sometimes I, I go to meetings that, that are sort of consultant led and you do a, you do a couple exercises and you may, you maybe, you know, they're sort of, sort of more structured and more organized than I'm looking for. And I'm looking for something that's a little bit more free ranging and, and able to input, you know, so that, so that you have maybe, maybe you don't, uh, you know, come with the idea and the solution that you're, that you, that you're proffering, but you, you come away with some more questions and, and some different directions that you might be able to think. So, and it's, and it's really just an encouragement, I think, to, as you, structure the groups and the and the, the public meetings and the small group sessions that that they they give a robust opportunity for the for the residents to to sort of uh, give input into the process and that and that it's not sort of necessarily structured input that it may be more free ranging input so that was one thing and then I wanted to go back to uh, you know over the last 20 years or so, and we've had a lot of uh, a lot of discussions several years ago in the legislature and in the in the housing market that uh, Colorado had because you know perhaps because of construction defect litigation that we had enacted in the late 90s and early 2000s had sort of put the quash on uh, condominiums and townhome construction. Um, you know, and I looked around at what we've built in Wheat Ridge, and we've had a number of projects sort of in the in the 20, 30, 40 unit that are for sale product. And what I, you know, are there strategies, and I, you know, we need to answer this now, but I think we need to talk about strategies. Uh, and as a city, we, we put a, um, we did some construction defect uh, mitigation legislation that we put in place. We put plat notes in place to try to encourage the development of, of for sale um, multifamily products so that uh, you know, my my children are in the in their first home buying or or you know residence buying uh, phase in their life because you know knock on wood they're out of the house, and um, but there may not be that that type of product is not generally available or has been is less available in the market in metropolitan Denver uh, than it has been. Are there are there opportunities for us as a city to sort of foster? Uh, those developments that a may be walkable and 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 maybe we um, you know as you create placemaking I think placemaking things are great I hope we don't think just about the, the 38th Avenue as a placemaking place because I think there are other neighborhoods and maybe as we 
sort of become a leader as a city and a leader of the 21st century in making walkable communities, um, that, that there are a number of, of smaller market type where they're more pedestrian oriented and we have and we when we sort of focus that we're that we kind of decrease our reliance on the automobile because we we're able to to diffuse some of the goods and services that people want to have sort of closer to home so not not necessarily a but but we need to sort of do that I think in conjunction with with a variety of home purchasing purchasing options um, you know, not just not just single family rentals and not just single family home ownership, but a variety in the marketplace. There was some other, uh, Miss Hoppy. We just may oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. To uh, Larry's comments about process and outreach, uh, which we certainly appreciate. Uh, I want everybody to know that uh, we are we're in constant communications with um, us staff, uh, uh, steering committee members. And we have uh, had some conversations in the last couple of days or the week, last week or so about making sure that these things are being robustly um, advertised and uh, you're likely to see some changes um, at the city website toward that end as well as uh, other avenues for getting the word out. Um, that being said, it's also true that no engagement process is 100% count, right, of, of everybody in town. Mm -hmm. And so... One of the things we try to do is uh, provide different kinds of opportunities, uh, in different, using different tools, techniques, and methods to get not just the same input from everybody all the time, the same, same types, but different types, and so to, toward different ends. Um, that's what we call our, our mixed method approach. And so while we'll have some um, unstructured, just come tell us what you think opportunities mm -hmm. at open houses and things like that, we also will have some things like um, your speaker walked into, maybe not exactly knowing what he was walking into, which was more structured, which was a, a, a scenario-based conversation, not designed to tell us whether those two things were good or not good, but rather, why are they not good or not good? How do you make that decision? On what basis? What does that say about what's important to you? So that, that gives us a certain kind of information um, from 10 or 12 Wheat Ridge residents around a table that would be really hard to get otherwise because it's hard to walk up to somebody in a gymnasium at the high school and say, hi, what do you care most about in life, you know? And then will you tell us that and we'll translate it into your, uh, your planning document. It kind of doesn't work that way. So uh, we use these little, these little tricks to, to make that happen. But we will, uh, Mayor, to your question, there will be different kinds of opportunities and we will do our best to make sure that those things are uh, clear about which one do you want to come to on what date for what purpose and what will your involvement look like? Thank you. Thank you for responding to that. And I'd like to dovetail a little something on what the mayor just said. Um, in the past, we've had outreach is issues, but um, they were very structured and they had to pick a choice of A, B or C or D. And people would stand up and say, well, I don't, where's none of the above? I don't like that. And when we sh start shutting our citizens out by not having a none of the above option, then they think the fix is in and they get discouraged and some of them would leave those meetings even and, and just tune out the rest of the thing as they're saying you can't fight City Hall. Um, so I really appreciate the fact that you're trying to keep and maintain that openness to get outside the nine dots, if you will. We don't just present a, a preset definition. I would ask, uh, when you have these meetings, are you keeping track of the dem uh, demographics of your recipients so that we can come back at the end and say, well, we got an equal number of these people and an equal number, or you know, what I'm saying is a statistically valid number of recipients. We're, we're doing our best um, to ask people, you know, th things like, um, not sort of, you know, demographic questionnaire stuff, race, uh, gender, that kind of thing so much, but how long have you lived in Wheat Ridge? Are you an owner? Are you a renter? To the extent that they are comfortable sharing that information so we can get a sense of who we're talking to. And if we say, okay, well, we know Wheat Ridge is half rental, but amazingly, 90% of our meeting attendees are homeowners, right? So then um, it means one of two things. Either we have to to the extent we have, t we have engagement opportunities left in the process, we need to make an effort to get more renters. Or, barring that, what we need to do is weight that input appropriately, right? 
So, um, and that is uh, sometimes as much art as it is science and subject to things that we can't control about who, who wants to show up when on a Tuesday night or a Saturday morning or whatever it is. But um, ho hopefully that answers your question, at least for now. Thank you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to draw this, uh, th this item to a close. I want to make sure that everyone's had an opportunity, yeah, Mr. Peterson. Uh, <clears throat> I have to preface this by saying my former dean always said that he did not use me for diplomacy. So <laughs> with that said, <clears throat> I, w one of the things you didn't give us in this book was a kind of summary statement about the state of Wheat Ridge today. And when I read, so I had to furnish my own. When I read this, the conclusion I came to was this is a half empty. This is a city that's half empty rather than a city that's half full. And I happen to be a half full thinker and not a half empty thinker. I found that some of the things that you said, I took, I mean, my, my book is full of notes. Um, a lot of the things that you said, for instance, about the age of the housing stock, <clears throat> I, I have the, I guess I'm unique in the room. I've only lived here a year and a half. And so I walked into a steaming hot housing market. You referred to it as a starter home. I moved from a 112 year old four square to a brick ranch for twice the money that I had in my old Foursquare. So I don't, it's not my starter home. I'm way past starter homes, but that's what it costs to buy into this market. Now, when you talk about the, the age of houses, I mean, I came from a 112 year old house. So I now live in a 50 year old house. Now it's about 55 years old, I guess. I don't think that, a, that's not an old house. That's a fairly new house. And, and you say, it seems like uh, houses that were built from 1980 forward are somehow seen as better houses. I'm sorry, the 1970s and 1980s were a sort of low point in architecture in the United States, or certainly for individual homes. Uh, there's some pretty miserable damned architecture out there that was built in the 70s and 80s. It's cheap, it doesn't have any character, it doesn't have any class. There it is. So, so I take that as a kind of half-empty comment about Wheat Ridge also. I like the housing stock here. When my wife and I moved here, we could have lived in any number of neighborhoods. Uh, we wanted to be, <clears throat> she works at Regis, we wanted to be within cycling distance of regions, Regis, and we wanted a community we could walk around in. So I now live three blocks from uh, Red Coast Pizza and fortunately a block and a half from Colorado Plus. So uh, we got the kind of place we wanted. We're new here, uh, we're not poor, and we're not uneducated, so the place is attracting the right kind of people. I, I think it's the right kind of people that you want. Um, I don't think we're unique. Uh, there aren't many houses for sale here, so you don't have a lot of turnover. If you had more houses for sale, you'd have more turnover. You'd also have fewer rentals because the place would become more and more desirable. So uh, I think the, the, I don't see the rentals as a problem. I see the rentals as a symptom. And I don't think you address it by addressing rentals. I think you address it by addressing context for housing. I, I think. Uh, Maybe that's enough for now, but I think, I really do think it's, unnecess it's an unnecessarily negative view of Wheat, of Wheat Ridge. And I'd like to see it sort of flipped and made a little happier. Thank you. Uh, I, I, will, I will just say that um, I won't pass judgment on old houses. I used, I used to live in a 1910 house. I traded for a 2013 house. I like my 2013 house better, but um, it's the, the market is, is telling us these things. So, you know, Mike could have a different opinion or Thomas could have a different opinion, but uh, the, the data is fairly clear in the absence of um, either uh, really good architectural character, um, you know, the kind of thing that's actually kind of rare to find, or really, really good location. 
um, that it, an older house uh, that doesn't have particularly a lot of character but is going to cost a lot to fix up uh, and maybe not be a, all that great when it's done, that the market will look at that and say, eh, we, we re we'd rather not. Let, let us continue around. I want to go to Mr. Bucknam and then I'll, I'll Mr. Dorsey and then Ms. Weaver. Yeah, I just, I just had one, just one point, uh, one, one thing I wanted to point out in terms of the research that I think uh, would, it, it would, would be helpful for, for the NRS, uh, and this dovetails with Mr. Peterson's uh, comments. Um, anecdotally, uh, within half a mile of my house, uh, I know three or four different people who recently moved into the neighborhood from Boulder and from West Denver because the, uh, the housing stock was uh, newer, uh, than where they were living and about half the price per square foot. That's actually when we moved in, that's, we got about half the price per square foot and uh, we got twice as much house, so we loved it. O to that point, uh, some statistics I did not see, some areas I did not see mentioned in the housing stock characteristics, single family housing units by era built is uh, Denver. Now I know Denver is very large, uh, specifically West Denver, Northwest Denver, Berkeley, Highlands, Sloan's Lake. I, I think those are very legitimate uh, areas to compare to Wheat Ridge, especially on the east side. Um, I would also uh, encourage you to look at Boulder because there are a lot of people. Uh, I know a couple of software engineers who just moved into District 1 from Boulder because, like I said, they, they found it a very affordable place to live. It's very close to Denver. It's still very close to the mountains. Those are my only comments. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Dorsey. Can I, can I just... Oh, yes, you may, please. Um, yeah, just quickly, um, definitely with when I was looking at the retail potential, I, I, I sensed the same sort of immigration. And, and I think that's partly why some of these businesses that have arrived on 38th have developed a following um, and, and why I think there is even greater potential for West 38th as a place because that is a, a psychographic, if you want to use that term, um, that really values place. They're coming from communities which have established places. And they, it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost uh, table stakes at this point um, for, for, where, for where they would move. So yeah, uh, we're well, definitely seeing that. Um, and that is, a, that is a glass half full story about Wheat Ridge, which. Uh, and, and by the way, um, I drive around Wheat Ridge and I, I spent five years working for the city of Boulder. I live near there, so I know Boulder pretty well. But when you drive around Wheat Ridge, there's, you know, half of it looks just like half of Boulder, right? I mean, it doesn't really particularly look all that different. Uh, much of it was, was built in the same era. Um, you know, house types are similar, setbacks are similar, lot sizes are similar. Um, it's also true that there are some parts of Wheat Ridge actually that are qu where house quality is not a problem. It's, there's some pretty cool houses here. There's some really neat uh, mid-century, 1950s, 1960s neighborhoods that I would move into tomorrow. So it's not that every old house is bad. This goes back to the generalizations and the exceptions uh, comment. Um, there's some good stuff to work with here, but it, it is, uh, there is a large chunk of the housing stock here that is likely to be problematic going forward because it's, it's not what we're talking about. It's not in, in a condition or a location that people are, are necessarily gonna want. So it's, it's something to be thinking about going forward. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. I may be the oldest one here, <laughs> and I've lived in uh, Denver, uh, Paris, France, uh, where it's really old. Uh, Wheat Ridge, I've been here for 32 years, 33 years. I lived in Wheat Ridge. Uh, I've lived in houses that were 1890s in Denver. I rehabbed a, a Redstone in Denver, it was 1890. I had a 1937 house in uh, Bonnie Bray. Neither of those are what I consider old. They were great houses. Still are, still there, and they're all occupied. Uh, I look at my neighborhood, I'm in District 3. Uh, I look at, District 1 with some older, older houses that uh, were uh, brought into Wheat Ridge when Wheat Ridge was formed, but were really old Jefferson County, 1800s houses. Uh, that is not a real problem. 
they seem to be occupied. I don't see any for sale signs uh, there for months and months and months. Uh, I look at other areas, I don't see for sale signs uh, staying up for months, there may be three or four days. I look at the value of the house that I'm in, uh, has quadrupled in the last 10 years, which is amazing. Uh, so I can't say our housing stock is all that bad. I mean, the way this looks, it looks like we're saying the housing stock is bad. It's like Richard was saying here, it isn't bad. It's good housing stock. Uh, you, we have dead areas in the city that if we wanted to invest somehow, dead areas would be 44th Avenue, uh, west of Kipling, north of 44th, all the way to the crossings, okay? We have real dead areas there that with some thought and investment in time or money or whatever it would be to convert that into a walkable city area. Uh, a lot of land, a lot of vacant land. Farm, it's zone farm. Um, it's not occupied with farms. It's not occupied hardly at all. Um, chicken coops. So I'm just saying if we're going to try to make <laughs> nothing, nothing. You have chicken coops. It's great. But I'm just saying that we have areas of Wheat Ridge where we've got million dollar houses. I have a friend that uh, he passed away. His wife just sold his house not too far from me. Uh, I don't have a million dollar house, but it was a million three they got for it. So I'm just saying we have a diversified housing stock in Wheat Ridge. Uh, the metro area is crying for affordable housing. Just crying for affordable housing. We have a lot of that. And it's occupied, whether it's rented or <laughs> new starter families. And so I just look at the report and I say, well, we have a, a, uh, an area, a, a city here that has a lot of age, like me, <laughs> that uh, 82, that, uh, you know, but that's not a problem. I've lived in neighborhoods uh, other than Wee Ridge, same thing. Uh, so it's as a younger person. And so I'm just saying that I, I think we need to focus on what I call dead areas. And we have a number of dead areas in the city that needs to have some real attentions put. Uh, that 44th Avenue, 44th Avenue from Sheridan all the way to uh, uh, to the crossings needs to be rehabbed. And I think the emphasis needs to be put there rather than saying, okay, these neighborhoods, we need to tear all these old places down and build new ones. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Okay. They don't do that in Europe. Uh, the, the housing stock in Europe is the same housing stock as they had 50 years ago when I first went. Uh, over to Europe. So, uh, and they don't call it old. I had a place in Paris that was uh, uh, 1890. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's one of these things that, you know, I didn't consider it old. <laughs> you know, I look at the, uh, I mean, Thank you. it's rather demeaning to say that our housing stock is ugly, <laughs> which basically I think you've all said, uh, you've said. Or well, the report in the, says. In the final there report, so. Right, okay, right. that's so, enough, that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Weaver. I'm gonna come back a little bit about the uh, last uh, couple comments. Um, I agree with you uh, that Wheat Ridge is half empty, but I think it's half empty with the people that are not sitting here in this room. 
and those are the people that are young. There's, sorry, there are some young people in here. And I think this report really reflects what's happening in Wheat Ridge. Um, I'm a demographer by background, and this is all correct stuff that's being reported about Wheat Ridge. And in my mind, I, I'm asking the question, how do we get more young people? Because revitalization, as much as all of us love Wheat Ridge, we started here maybe in a starting starter home or maybe we came here halfway through our lives. I happen to have done that. Um, but I am, I, I know that there's defense when we, when we get a report like this and when we wanna keep what we have going well in a community, we all love Wheat Ridge. Um, I'd love to see more younger people in Wheat Ridge loving Wheat Ridge so it continues to be this very vibrant place. And, and I think by not necessarily taking offense by this and, and looking to our young people who, who need homes or who are buying starter homes and asking those questions of what do, we, what do we want that other half of Wheat Ridge to look like? Because I think we know what this half feels like. And, and I love living here and I love my situation and I love my house. Um, but I'm also not in my 20s or in my 30s with little kids wanting to find a great place like Wheat Ridge to live. And, and the, the young people that have created some of these amazing placemaking in the last 10 years in Wheat Ridge, I mean, right, they're now no longer young. So um, I just, I would caution us about getting defensive and thinking about uh, where we want to go. Thank you. I want to. I want to go to Miss Dozman. Thank you. Uh, that gave me a great segue to jump in. I appreciate that. Um, so I am not at all surprised that we are having this conversation right now. Uh, when I was running for office a year ago, I kept having what I called the great debate, and it was whether retail, so shopping, followed rooftops housing, or whether rooftops followed retail. And I think that this. Um, data really shows that retail does in fact follow rooftops and we have been having conversations for the last year about land uses, zoning, um, accessory dwelling units, bulk plane, height and density. We're having all of these conversations around what we want our housing stock to look like, what we want our community to look like and that is really going to determine the demographic that we attract into the community, the retail that we attract, how we are going to usher in the future, the younger generations that are inevitably going to be moving into Wheat Ridge and taking over and determining what this community looks like. Um, I am a renter. My parents are fortunate enough to own two properties in Wheat Ridge. If my parents did not own my childhood home and if I were not living in my childhood home with my children, I would not be able to afford to live in Wheat Ridge. I am, I am educated. Um, I am young. I have two children. Um, and and I, I am the next generation. I am the new face of Wheat Ridge. And while I love older brick homes, and that is my architectural preference, that is not everybody else's preference, and that is not what the market is telling us is what is hot and what is attractive. And I've said this on the dais before, one of the biggest reasons I ran for city council was because Pennington Elementary was facing a closure. We've seen Martinson Elementary close, we've seen Fruitdale close, we've seen Wheat Ridge Middle School change into Wheat Ridge 5 through 8 and then close. We've seen all of these schools close down because we are not attracting young families into our community to take over. We do not have children in the seats of our schools. So if we're talking about what kind of future we want to create for Wheat Ridge, we really need to be thinking about the young families and how to attract them and how to have that cycle start to turn over because I love that my my parents are reaching a retirement age and that they're going to be they're in their dream home here in Wheat Ridge and I need to be able to look to the future and understand that my parents are going to want to age in place and that likely means that I'm going to be taking care of them in one of the homes that we own here in this community and so we really need to think creatively about our housing stock and I think that in the next three years that I'm sitting in this seat I really want to tackle these tough issues of what 
our land uses are going to be, what kind of zonings we have and what we allow in those zonings, and how we can creatively create a housing market that not only attracts young families, but also allows for our parents to age in place and for us to have this holistic community that is really inclusive of all of the demographics. Um, and I also wanted to thank CZB, MJB, and all of the volunteer steering committee members for um, devoting your time and energy into this. I, I know that it's um, a hard task to tackle and those conversations could probably get pretty difficult at times. Um, and so thank you for having those conversations and I'm really looking forward to doing the work that this is going to bring about. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Byrne, would you like to come back on that and press your green button? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of tying together the last two comments. Uh, Make sure the green button is on. Oh. And then, sorry. then move your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Technologically illiterate. Um, uh, that, yes, for most types of retail, uh, retail follows rooftops. So I want to add one little nuance to that, which I think is particularly relevant given what we're discussing, is that there is a certain type of retail that can also help to catalyze rooftops. And that's why, you know, we're, we're so focused on West 38th, is that that, the creation of a place there, that is what a younger generation is craving. Um, and, and, and like uh, Eric said, that is, those are table stakes. That just gets you in the conversation. If you don't even have that place, then you're not even in the conversation. So I think that's the sort of retail that actually can help catalyze the rooftops and in lieu of it the rooftops that are your next generation uh, aren't aren't as likely to materialize so uh, mr larson larson please thank you mayor the I only read this for the first time within the last week um, and uh, i believe me i appreciate the effort that went into this i don't doubt any of the uh, I don't doubt the veracity of any of the conclusions that you drew from the demographics and from where the, where the where Wheat Ridge came from to where it is today. The question I have is, uh, I guess going forward, and, and now that we've, I guess tonight concludes, or at least we get to the milestone for phase one, is that um, the the report is generally dire. I mean, that's the way I read it. It's it's, it's not a real rosy sort of picture, okay? The conclusion on page 23 is that uh, foreseeable future mean facilitating housing investments for the market, financially assisting in retail and commercial development alongside visible corridors, investing money in political capital and planning, zoning, and code enforcement. The package comes with significant financial costs and political costs. Is, is Wheat Ridge willing to pay? And, and so I, I guess my question is, the question is raised, but there's not even a clue as to what that significant financial and political cost might be. So my suggestion for the consultants going forward is that the next time we hear back, they at least consider some of that. And whether it's a, a percentage of, you know, where Wheat Ridge spends its money or maybe some political things that have to happen, but some sort of a quantification of what has to happen to move this thing forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are at just about nine o'clock. I would like to, uh, to bring this to a close. I wanna thank you all very much for um, your report, for coming to us and presenting it. I'd like to thank all of the, the uh, members here, uh, uh, for the Planning Commission for coming and, and uh, providing your input. This is really exciting stuff. I think, uh, I, you know, it kind of charges you up on the inside to see that we're, I think, having a good conversation. I think we all understand the, uh, that the broader in scope and the, uh, the more listening that we can do and reaching out to the various members of our community, the better feedback we'll get. And I think we'll be able to make some good decisions. And so I really want to thank uh, the members of the steering committee in particular. We have. We have one of the co-chairs here, at least, or, or did, and uh, she, uh, she had something else, perhaps. Um, but I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks to, to the steering committee, and um, we will uh, look forward to see the process going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. 
So, and the Planning Commission, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it is uh, one minute until nine. I would like to be back in our seats. I need a short recess by uh, eight or nine minutes after the hour, and we will, we will uh, hopefully get to our next item and uh, take care of that. So, thank you.
counselors back. Let's see. Let's count count noses. Now we've got uh, one, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pond and Mr. Fitzgerald, and um, that's it. Okay. Christine. Great. All right, Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald will be right back with us in a minute. In the meantime, I think we should move on to. Um, Item number two, this is a moratorium on single family building permits associated with subdivision approvals. Uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a presentation on this? Uh, we do, we have, um, we have staff here this evening, um, Ken Johnstone, Lauren Mikulek, and Mr. Dahl is here also, so um, I think Ken's gonna, um, you're, you're gonna introduce Yeah, I'll get it. Okay. Johnstone, I'll get take it, it away. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you're well aware and has been discussed already this evening, uh, City Council did adopt a 90 day temporary moratorium uh, at your October 22nd meeting uh, through an emergency ordinance. Uh, it's on a fairly uh, limited class. It, it, it's on a moratorium on the issuance of single family building permits for a very limited class of single family lots, uh, specifically single family lots that are zoned R1 and that have been approved through an administrative subdivision process. Uh, as we discussed in the staff report, that uh, ends up applying to uh, two lots in Wheat Ridge um, and both of those individuals have have testified earlier in the meeting. Uh, given the short uh, duration of the moratorium, 90 days goes quick, uh, particularly over the holidays with uh, limited meeting times. Uh, if City Council does wish to make any code amendments that uh, are responsive uh, to the issues at hand uh, during that 90 day term of the moratorium, those would have to happen fairly quickly. Uh, presumably those could uh, potentially be uh, amendments to the zoning code chapter 26 and if that's the case that also requires an issue or a public hearing before the planning commission and we've mapped out kind of a, a possible timeline uh, in the the memo that was included in your packets um, uh, we've presumed uh, based on the testimony on the 22nd that the moratorium was adopted uh, at least in part uh, based on the recently approved subdivision lot at 4055 Everett uh, and because of, because of that, staff has really taken the liber liberty of proposing some options uh, using that situation as a, as a taking off point and a reference point in terms of some of the issues that were raised uh, by the community members during that, uh, that meeting. Uh, we, the first two options in the ordinance are really procedural options. Uh, those would not be uh, retroactive and therefore would not affect the two lots in question. If those were an option, you should choose to go uh, the final three options are really more substantive in nature uh, and would change potentially or propose to change some of the substantively some of the uh, zoning requirements as it relates to single family residential development. Um, the final three options also might uh, require some more substantive discussion uh, that maybe would take uh, more than uh, the 90 day period of uh, the moratorium that you've currently adopted. Uh, since all of these options are kind of presumptive um, on our part, uh, we just kind of threw some ideas out there uh, without any really direction from council as of yet. Uh, so I'm not sure I wanna uh, run down a lot of specificity in any one of those options. I'm glad to speak to any of them uh, at your direction, but I really think I might just suggest to kick it back to council to see, to see whether any of those uh, are of interest, uh, whether you have other ideas uh, or of course, you still have the option of choosing to take uh, no action. So I'm, I think we're all here to collectively answer questions. Okay, thank you. We'll start with Ms. Hoppy. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like to say I was not at this meeting. However, I did watch the thing in entirety online. Therefore, someone suggested that everybody have to go through all of their comments to get me up to speed. I'm up to speed. No need to go through all of that. Um, <clears throat> and. So at that point, at that, as everybody's comments are going through, just so you know, I watched the, I watched the show. Thank you. Um, additional discussion. Ms. Uh, Dozman. So I would just like to say that I believe um, t the meeting two weeks ago was a great um, starter conversation and that I think that we should definitely um, look at how procedural changes can maybe happen within our code um, so that some of these issues don't arise at a later time. But I am not in support of any of the options being retroactive and punishing um, those that have gone through the legal process of doing what was already on the books. 
Um, I do believe that when we're talking about a major change within a neighborhood, that the neighborhood should have um, the opportunity to have public input. But I think that some of the testimony today talking about how unfair and unjust it would be to impose regulations on citizens that have gone through a legal process of laws that we've already created and set in place is kind of pulling the rug out from underneath them. And so I, that is very unsettling. Um, my support of the moratorium was more uh, to have those conversations of the procedural changes. And so I just wanna put that out there. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. <coughs> well, uh, I just would like to uh, say that uh, this feels to me like we're doing something that is for a specific property. And I think making law around some very narrow specific situation is malpractice. I, I don't think we ought to be doing that. We ought to be making laws that will apply uh, to everybody in, in the future. So uh, on, I would object to do, doing anything with this specific location in mind. So. If, if we're going to do something, I th you know, it has to be something that's more general in nature. But as I look at all these things, um, I don't see any that I consider satisfactory. Um, I, um, I have a house that has a flag lot right behind me, for example, and uh, life goes on. Um, so that's uh, not a problem uh, for me. Um, option five, the bulk plane regulations won't affect this house and hardly affect anything in an R1 zone. So it's, it's more of a gesture than it is something that has substantive uh, effect on anything. Um, and the other, other suggestions about neighborhood meetings and so on, uh, I think a comment from staff in there is, is right, that we don't want to give the impression to the neighborhood that they're, be, that they're able to control what happens to somebody else's property. Um, I think it's because what happens to somebody else's property is going to be the law, is going to be applied, not, not particularly what the neighborhood wants. So I, I believe the city is in essence uh, doing it about as well as we can do it. So I would not be in favor of taking any action. Mr. Pond. Contrary to Ms. Hoppy, I, I did not watch the entire uh, video at this point, yet I'm going to make a comment <laughs> regardless, <laughs> having, having fo followed the um, discussion prior to the meeting um, and reading through, reading through this and hearing public comment tonight, I'll limit it to, to that uh, portion of it. I tend to agree with Councilmember Fitzgerald that none of these are none of these at least on their face tonight um, are you know options that I want to um, pursue um, seriously I, I will say that option three uh, four and five are ones that I think we should be considering and this is what I was referring to in the previous discussion that this is some of the options, some of the things that we need to do in our neighborhoods, both for the housing stock and the character and things like that, are address this in through our NRS and ultimately through zoning zoning changes. And I th we've talked about this multiple times over the last several months, and even prior that that I think some of these things may need to be considered, and then we need to work on them. For instance, if we do overlay districts, that's that's a tremendous amount of work. We should get that recommendation and the reason for doing that through the NRS, and then we should 
through the rest of the prioritization, we should determine that that's the work that we want to do because that's not insignificant work. But I think that that probably is coming. I'm just not ready to 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 say that tonight, and I don't think we should have to. Um, option one and two, um, I think. Um, again, maybe this is a, is where I would agree with Council Member Fitzgerald that doing nothing is perhaps the, 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 the where I would be on this is letting this moratorium pass. But uh, because even these options, I think, um, are ones we'd have to be careful about uh, because we are, we are basically saying, listen, if you fit all of our requirements right now, you don't. <clears throat> Public hearing really, we wouldn't want to inappropriately give the impression that that, that has, uh, has greater effect than what's in our codes because it doesn't right now. So the only reason to do, to do more notice and more public hearings in options one and two, I think again is for, for getting information right now and understanding how, you know, get, getting the input that we're getting right, right now moving forward through the, through the NRS. So I would only be willing to entertain something like those as a means of, of information gathering to be used for some of these other options down the road. Otherwise, I think it's been clearly laid out here that because they're um, considered ministerial, that, that um, it's kind of, it may be a little bit of a, of, of a conflict or a perceived conflict to have a public hearing. Um, and so I would avoid that. Ms. Hoppy. I believe if, I agree with Ms. Dozman in that I don't feel that we should be retroactively um, affecting anything that has happened in the past. Um, I agree with the uh, Councillor Fitzgerald and, and, and Pond that I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of these options that have been applied as in something that we should move on immediately, but I do think that it's something that we can look at in the future. <clears throat> Under option four, it says that um, to be able to do an overlay zone, it has to be, for it to be able to be adopted, it requires written approval of at least 25% of the owners within the specified geographic area, and I just don't think that's even enough. But um, if that's the way we have it in our code, yes, we got caught in a spot with our code that needed updated, just like we did when before bulk plane was put in place. And, um, you know, we try to be <clears throat> proactive in these situations, um, but, you know, oftentimes it comes up before, you know, before us even really realizing it, that it, um, the effects of it. So um, my request is I would like to um, plead with the counselors that were here on the 22nd who voted for the moratorium to, um, at our next business meeting, uh, ask for it to be reconsidered and um, to vote to lift the moratorium. And then I would like um, for us to have zoning, for this to be immediately addressed through study session and um, through um, future city council meetings. But I don't feel like we need to hold the moratorium until that happens. A, it puts a really tight deadline on us, but B, there's two people who are, um, who, if we're not doing it retroactively, it shouldn't be affecting them negatively, and it will be affecting them negatively if we make them wait around until January. Thank you. Additional um, discussion. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I, I, I think that um, trying to preserve the individual property rights of individual property owners compared with the ability to provide input uh, by the residents, I, I would agree with the memo and the fact that as much as we might want public input at this ministerial level of uh, uh, decision making within the one to three lot subdivisions, you know, as much as that it seems appropriate and desirable, in reality it, it doesn't impact the decision because of the, the sort of mechanics and the, the, the basic math of those types of subdivisions. But I guess we're, you know, I would be more comfortable with down the road. Uh, looking at setting up some of these uh, zoning overlay areas and encouraging residents in some of our more um, characteristically um, historic neighborhoods like Bel Air, that they would be encouraged to participate in that overlay process and uh, have those overlays put you know, in those specific neighborhoods. But as it relates to existing uh, subdivisions that have already been done, I, I'd be hard pressed to 
keep that from happening since it's already been approved. And I think we should learn from our mistakes in that regard and try to come up with overlay districts that would work uh, within specific uh, neighborhoods. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Um, again, I have to bring up the, the, the concept here that in our codes it says that the intent of our codes is to let all people participate in decisions that affect their property. And in this case, that just doesn't happen. And that's probably whatever happened in 2014, blame the council if you want. Um, there are a lot of people that are affected by this that had absolutely no say in what's going to happen. And I'm probably stuck with a position that I don't think there's anything we can do about the subdivision at this point in time. But that's why this moratorium was somewhat written as building permits. And I think it behooves us not to waste our time tonight to just say, oh, well, it's too late, too bad, so sad. 20 people in the neighborhood, you lucked out. Um, I think we ought to consider all of the, this again if we have to, not we have these options, and see what we can do to, A, get rid of administrative subdivisions and make them all part of maybe minor subdivisions where as a minimum they go through planning or council but planning commission and council um, because we open a new can of worms and I you know there's there's all kinds of hypotheticals of what can happen here with a building p permit on this on this property now and there's all the control of protecting the neighborhood itself is just gone. And I just don't think it's right to the other people that have, they have invested considerable money in their homes and expected to have the character of their neighborhood stay relatively secure and, and the same. And we're just telling them, too bad, so sad. And so... I think maybe the subdivision process, even if we can't do something there, by adding some building permit rules for this before we get rid of administrative subdivisions may help be a compromise that would allow them to do what they're trying to do and yet help the neighborhood do what they're trying to do. If we just blow it off, then we're not doing what we should and need to do. Um, I don't know yet what's going to be built there for sure. But I mentioned, I see here in the paper, they're talking about demoing the garage on the existing house. So now we're going to have a house in a million dollar neighborhood that's a smaller house that has no garage. I don't know what to do with that. Hypothetically speaking, does it fit? Does it not? I just don't know. Who's going to want to move in? Who's going to want to go in, move by a house without a garage in that neighborhood? Is that now a new rental in an R1 neighborhood again? I don't know. Um, the cross section that, that they've shown us here looks to me like it's the back of the house. So we now have the back of a house facing the street. I don't know. I can't tell from the information that's there. But those are things that if we don't address some controls now, it'll be too, then we'll be up at the same point and say, well, that's too late. You know. Um, we can't do anything about it. Anytime we try and make a change, we're going to step on somebody's toes. It, it, it's just, you can't help it. There's going to be someone that just bought a property and who knows what their intentions were, but they'll come back and say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're not treating me fairly. So we keep kicking this stuff down the can. This was talked about in 14 and change, and maybe not rightfully so, but there are so many things like bulk planning and other issues that I've heard were brought up 10, 20 years ago. And we've just, as a council, as a city, we've just never taken the time to say, okay, we have to draw a line in the sand and start addressing some of these issues. And there, and I tried to address that at, at our meeting, that we're at the crux here of doing a lot of hard of, of trying to decide a lot of hard issues 
in it, and it's time we have to take control and be proactive instead of reactive. And this is, of course, a reactive right now operation that we're going through. Um, one of the speakers mentioned, you know, well, it's not 1964 anymore. Things have to change. But I think we need to be able to control how things change. If we're going to keep selling ourselves as a rural, you know, oasis, there's no reason why we have to become like Arvada or somebody else. There will always be someone that wants to have these homes with large lots. I mean, why does it? Ha why does that part have to change? Maybe some of our newer areas, we we can change there, and you you can accommodate what's going on throughout the city that way. But if we don't stick, if we keep just saying, yep, too hard, we can't do it, we're just not doing our jobs. And where do you start? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dozman? So I completely agree that we need to stop kicking the can down the road. Um, I think that these land use issues have repeatedly come up, um, and it's time that we take a holistic approach. And we've talked about this at several meetings in the last year about how we need to stop piecemealing all of this together and stop addressing things um, reactively and how we need to look at the broader picture and start discussing you know, what the zonings look like and what is allowed in them and start proactively addressing a lot of these issues. So I agree in the respect that you know, it's, it's high time that all of these issues finally become addressed, but that's not to say that they won't change in the future with a different council or a different demographic within the city that's um, ushering in that change or, or pressuring for that change. Um, and as far as the specifics go with this project, you know, I think it's, I think change is really um, uncomfortable at times and it's sometimes challenging to uh, accept but I do believe that when people are a part of the process and are agents of that change, that they are more likely to accept it. And so the fact that we are trying to create a more inclusive process that includes public input, I think that that is a great start. Um, and, and you're right that maybe we need to get rid of subdivisions at an administrative level altogether, but I think that that really puts a burden on the planning commission and, and council to be, um, you know, overseeing more than we already are. And like we see how little time we have and how, you know, <laughs> long our agendas are and how, how much time we put it into these meetings. Um, and so I think that our staff and our administration is in place for a reason and that, and I feel like some of the things that we put in our code as as far as being administrative as opposed to having to come to council or planning commission, you know, th there's a reason for that. Um, and so I definitely want to tackle these topics and it's, but it's, I think it's kind of along those same lines of bulk plane and ADUs and everything that we're gathering in the NRS study, you know, it's, it's, it's coming and it, Honestly, it's not coming down quickly enough for my <laughs> for my liking, and I'd, I'd like to get my hands dirty and start talking about this all right now, but the fact of the matter is that we've impaneled 26 of our residents uh, on a steering committee. We've hired consultants. We're in the thick of gathering input, and it's a robust public input process, and you know, it's really hard for me to sit on my hands and wait for that input to come come down the line and for us to really start making those decisions and tackling those you know those those hard conversations and not kicking the can down the road but it's we're almost there we're so close thank you uh, miss hoppy I mean I from what I heard from everybody say tonight is that yes they do want to address this and yes it needs to be happening and soon and so I didn't hear anybody saying too bad, so sad, and we're kicking the can down the road. That was not what I heard hap in discussions here at all. Um, and so I, what I did hear, though, is that the options that were laid out weren't, aren't exactly ideal and that we need more time to be able to find a good policy to put in place for subdivision regulations. And um, at the end, 
uh, again at this point I would just like to say that I would like to ask if any of the councillors who voted yes on this on the 22nd if you will please ask for a reconsideration of it because I don't feel like this is something that we need to try to be get done within the time frame especially if we're going to do an overlay zone district I don't feel like we have the time to do that appropriately and so I would like for someone to remove the moratorium and I would like for this to stay on our docket for um, uh, for us to work on in the near future do we have a sense of the council did someone articulate that mr. Uh, Fitzgerald no, I was, uh, was, oh was answering your question. okay so, so uh, miss hoppy then can you formulate some some type of consensus, consensus? To, to move us forward the kind of the hard part okay I can the consensus I can try to formulate because I wasn't here is um, that we can't that as a council we will be looking at subdivision regulations um, in the near future and um, we'll specifically look at some of our um, more distinct neighborhoods and how to um, how to keep their um, quality and if that's create overlay zoning or um, uh, through changing things with flag lots, then that's something we'll be working on in the future. Is that a consensus that we can come to? Let me ask Mr. Dahl, uh, what's, our, what's our parliamentary procedural um, route where we are? We've got a couple of things going on. One is uh, the, the, the um, <clears throat> policy that Ms. Hoppy just articulated, which right. is sort of a forward-looking uh, direction of staff to to begin to bring right. or to continue to bring these these things forward and and flesh out uh, the options the staff I think has gotten some good feedback in terms of what you like and don't like generally about okay, them good um, so certainly you know um, you, you could vote on a consensus to bring those forward as policy matters when staff has more fully developed them and and that would be one thing okay uh, the other thing clearly that's out there is the procedural well, what about the moratorium right uh, your choices around that are as was described uh, your council rules allow for reconsideration at the next business meeting the next meeting is the next business meeting and it would have to be as she mentioned a motion made by a member voting in favor and I think they were all in favor that were in attendance uh, to reconsider and if, if uh, that passes as you get back in a time machine as I've said before and you take a second vote on whether or not the the ordinance uh, is approved or not uh, and and so it, another thing you could do or the council here could do if they wished would be to uh, it could be a consensus to put it on the agenda for 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 action understanding we don't have a motion yet from a council member on reconsideration that couldn't really be made until the next meeting yep. anyhow this right. is the state session can't can't do that right. but but if you're if there's a desire of the council here tonight to at least have a spot on the agenda next Monday where if that motion is made it gets made then we, we don't meet it in a week November 26 no. nope right. we have veterans, veterans day and then a study okay. session so the next regular meeting is 26 if, if you direct us to, to place it on the agenda for a spot on the agenda then it's there okay so so it would really be a consensus uh, uh, immediately to um, place an item for possible reconsideration or a, or a placeholder for possible reconsideration um, is there a consensus on the uh, and this would be on the 26th is there a consensus among council for that there is consensus to put a placeholder in for a possible reconsideration of the moratorium and then did we get a consensus and then on then do we have forward with the staff okay thanks then do we have a consensus to move forward with perhaps some new options on how we how we might balance property rights and neighborhood rights in terms of being able to strengthen neighborhoods perhaps provide some more input for uh, community um, and, and neighbor involvement in the designs of their own community um, and and there, there should be a, a number of ways to do that and I know that we have smart staff that can work through that does that sound sound right okay uh, mr. Matthews yeah I have a question for mr. Johnson what kind of could you walk us through a little bit about what the building permit 
process is going to be for these two new lots, two lots now, or, there, or at least the one. And well, if how, if how, I mean, if someone wanted to build a brick square, three three stories high, flat roof, could they do it? And would the building is are our hands tied there, or what's so the, uh, the presuming, or, or if I should say, the uh, moratorium is lifted, they'd be subject to the standard uh, residential plan review process. So uh, they'd submit for a building permit, they'd be reviewed uh, for building code compliance and zoning code compliance. Uh, both the lots in question, uh, as I think you know, are zoned R1. So they'd be subject to the R1 uh, zoning district requirements, which include maximum building height of 35 feet, um, minimum side yard setbacks of 15 feet. I think the minimum front yard setback is 30 feet. I think the maximum lot coverage is 25%. How am I doing? <laughs> so that that would be what they'd be reviewed against. Um, yeah, four off street parking spaces if there's not um, on street parking. Uh, so that could be two in a garage and two in a driveway. It could be four in a, in a, in a driveway. Um, but that would be the review. It's a, it's typically a two to four week turnaround on our initial review. Thank you. Okay. That will conclude item number two. Thank you very much for your work on that. We will move to item number three, I-70 Kipling Corridor Strategy. Mr. Goff, do we have a report on this? We do. Uh, Mr. Johnstone and, and Lauren Mikalek and myself, we're all here for that. Yeah, and I think um, we didn't put this on as a staff report, but we're really, it, it kind of is in that mm -hmm. genre of, uh, of really just an informational update. Uh, we wanted to be respectful of the fact that uh, you did in fact put um, in your top five priorities two items that relate to the I-70 Kipling corridor. Uh, one, encouraging uh, the city to work proactively with CDOT to try and get that project done, with that project being the uh, reconstruction of the interchange. Uh, that they've been studying for a number of years. Uh, and then the second project being uh, identification of a I-70 corridor strategy. So just wanted to uh, tonight give you an update on both of those. So uh, maybe start with the I-70 Kipling interchange, which has been in the works for a number of years. Uh, I-70 or CDOT using a consultant named David Evans Associate uh, completed a PEL, which is a preliminary environmental it's called the Planning and Environmental Linkages Study, so that's kind of a preliminary environmental assessment. They did that a couple years ago. Um, they've more recently been working on uh, the formal EA, which is the federal uh, FHWA uh, formal process for any project that's going to be involving uh, federal dollars. That, too, has been underway for probably, oh, a year and a half or so. Uh, they have a tentative public hearing set for December 11th, but that, that is a tentative date. They're still working with... Uh, CDOT and FHWA determine if they can get to that date. So there's no, uh, there's no time or location that's scheduled at this point. Project is estimated right now to cost, uh, I think, $63 million, so not an insignificant project. Uh, and that funding has not yet been identified. Uh, as I imagine most of you are aware, um, a day before uh, local elections here, uh, there are two uh, ballot questions, uh, Proposition 109 and Proposition 110, that in different ways fund uh, transportation improvements across the uh, the state. Um, I, I think with some level of certainty, we it's my understanding that 109 would not cover this project, that it's not in that, and, and uh, the 110 would, but there's probably some ambiguity in both those. I wouldn't take them with an absolute level of, of, of certainty. But lacking uh, funding, um, they can't make any final decision on an, on an EA process. Uh, if there is funding available, um, they would be looking to finalize the environmental assessment in uh, late winter, early spring, uh, and then move forward potentially a year or two down the road with uh, the beginning of acquisition of right-of-way and construction. Uh, but again, a high, hard to really know what's going to happen on that until uh, the results of the election are known. And uh, if neither of those uh, pass, then I think there's, there's not a clear path forward other than we know it's a high priority for CDOT, right? It's a, it's a public safety issue. It's not just a capacity issue. Uh, those on and off ramps back up into the, into the main line of I-70, and that presents a real public safety hazard. So they really are committed as an organization to get it, uh, to get it done. So that's, that's kind of the update on the, um, the first um, aspect of that, which is the interchange. 
Uh, the second major thing that's underway um, is that in response to you identifying uh, the notion of doing a corridor strategy, uh, we have hired another a division within that same company, David Evans Associate, uh, Will Wagonlander, who used to be with WSP and was an integral part of the uh, vision plan that council authorized for the TOD area. Uh, he's now with David Evans Associates and we've uh, entered in with a small, a small contract with him uh, to do some high level visioning from land, to, land use, transportation, connectivity, uh, kind of redevelopment, um, brainstorming, uh, and he's underway and under contract on that. Another aspect of his scope of work is that he's identifying urban design, landscaping, and signage betterments that could be part of the Kipling Interchange Reconstruction Project. So those might be things like enhancing the landscaping or enhancing bridge elements, putting masonry on those, identifying gateway signage locations. So things that could really make that interchange and the bridge structures uh, a gateway to the city of Wheat Ridge. So uh, he's working on those as kind of the first scope of his work. Uh, because those could then get included in some form or fashion into the EA uh, if that does indeed get finalized in the next several months. Uh, so those are underway um, and we'll be reporting out to you on, I think we're, the scope of work has a, the visioning effort done in January of next year, I believe. So we'll presumably be reporting out on both the ideas for betterments uh, and high level visioning uh, in the first quarter of, of next year. And then lastly, we had just added a little discussion of extended stay lodging. Uh, we do not currently define extended stay lodging uh, in our city. Uh, we only uh, define hotels and motels, which are permitted in various uh, commercial and mixed use districts. Um, we have talked about the notion over, um, it's a little bit embarrassing to say, but I dusted off a, a memo from uh, 2008 uh, where we had talked about this and, and didn't get direction to move forward with an ordinance at that time. But we have suggested that that could, by defining uh, extended stay lodging and saying what it is and what it isn't, uh, that could become an additional kind of uh, enforcement tool uh, in dealing with uh, some of the hotels up there that may, that we have some code enforcement challenges with. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a kickoff meeting with city staff and our city attorney's office uh, about a week ago. Uh, to talk about that idea. Uh, we do have it tentatively on your agenda for uh, November 19th for additional discussion. Uh, we also have a bunch of other stuff on that agenda, so we're not absolutely certain we're gonna be able to have that discussion uh, at that meeting, but that'll be coming to you for policy direction uh, in the coming uh, couple of months. So uh, that's something else that we're working on that could address some of the uh, police uh, calls uh, and the volume of police calls that we deal uh, deal with in that area. This would, if you had an extended stay definition or ordinance, this would impact uh, the motel uh, facilities up there also because they there may be some of that uh, some occupancy that is similar to that. In those that's correct. So to, so to the extent that you could uh, just a real general framework, right? But to the extent that you could define what an extended stay is in Wheat Ridge and say this, these are the components that you have to have, whether those be physical components or operational requirements. Mm -hmm. But you could, uh, because those are operational requirements, those could apply retroactively to the existing operators that have really presumably been, um, been approved as a hotel motel to generally operate for less frequent stays, right? Okay. Uh, generally yeah. less than 30 days. So. Uh, if we define those physical and operational components that are necessary to be a legitimate extended stay lodging facility, we could then go back to some of those hotels and motels that might be operating in extended stay fashion and say, these are the, the three things you need to do differently. Um, and if so, you, can, you too can operate as an extended stay. Uh, if, you, if you're not able to do those or choose not to do those, then you need to operate in a more traditional hotel motel fashion. And there's lots of policy issues around, uh, around that and how that would have implications for private property rights and uh, you know, the individuals that are occupying those places. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're sensitive to those, uh, but that's kind of the general okay. uh, notion. Can you take a couple of questions? Sure. Ms. Hoppe. You kind of just answered kind of what my question was. Denver just came out, uh, one of their offices just came out with a report that 40% of those experiencing homelessness in Denver have a job. 
they do not have affordable housing. And so that's kind of what ends up happening in those hotels. And so you said, you know, we're sensitive to that and we'll be paying attention. That was just my comments is just please try to keep that in mind while mm -hmm. looking at those. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Ms. Dozman. Yes, I would also like to be considerate of, of those oftentimes families because I know that uh, some of them go to peak and um, that is the only affordable option that they have in this community. And so I, I want to be mindful of not taking that away um, from those that are already struggling. But I understand that, you know, that there are some issues uh, surrounding that. And I think that you kind of... Um, calm some of my concerns with it's it's more of a policy around like if you want to be an extended stay um like business you have to adhere to these it's not you cannot be okay no and just just to reconfirm that i mean that was definitely an active part of our our conversation of is there's implications to doing this and those sure. are those are real people uh so uh thank you mr urban thank you mr mayor you know uh, and to that end uh the one of the least affordable housing options out there is in the uh, motel arena because of the uh, significant cost on a daily basis that it takes to to rent a room. So, you know, as much as we're thinking about those families, uh, to a larger extent, working on more affordable housing and those types of options uh, is what's really going to help those families as it relates to you know helping a motel um, continue to gouge those residents. That's a whole other issue, but. Uh, as it relates to the corridor overall, I would agree that, you know, working on uh, diversifying the uses in the area uh, away from simply the accommodations category, I think would help us in the long run. But, um, you know, the, uh, as far as the interchange is concerned, I don't really have any opinions about that, but I do think that diversifying the uh, land uses in that area would help us uh, over the long run. We do have a lot of industrial areas to the north there, and a lot of retail there, so uh, trying to mix that up, I think, would be a good move. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnstone, I, I read your deal here on the extended stay lodging ordinance, and I believe you said it was uh, 2006 that was dusted off from? Not quite. 2008. 2008, okay. Um, I said yay here, and this may not be an answer, but it's the first indication I've seen in the last three years that we're headed maybe toward, toward an answer. Mm -hmm. But this is a good example of what happens when councils kick things down the road. That's 10 years ago. And now, whenever we show our heat maps for our crime areas, guess what shows up? So we've been living with that for 10 years because we didn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that this council can be much more proactive and start looking for solutions like this that may be outside the nine dots for this problem and a lot of the other ones we've already talked about tonight. So yay on bringing that up, at least it gives us a stepping stone towards getting something done, provided we don't wait 10 more years to do it. Okay, thank you. And then uh, you had, I didn't, I didn't want to cut you off because I see another bullet point here on uh, private development activity. Yeah, I just in, in included a little bit of an update, uh, council, um, has probably noticed that the, the Kipling Village apartment uh, project on the um, on the, the west side of Kipling between 44th and I-70 has made some upgrades in the last several years uh, to their streetscape and to the facades. They're also going through a zoning uh, entitlement that'll, that'll be on your calendars. I think the public, I think the first reading is November 26th and the public hearings are January 14th. That's an amendment to the ODP to convert some uh, space that they've had that's been kind of unsuccessful commercial space uh, to be able to convert it to uh, back to residential units uh, and they've also made some upgrades to the units in general so good to see a little bit of investment there uh, on that property um, I mentioned the uh, Swiss flower um, upgrades in that proximity as well so that's a, a positive a real positive investment we think uh, and then the, the property on the east side of, of Kipling, you know, roughly between 44th and the Super 8 Motel has been going through an entitlement process recently for a concept plan. Uh, their zone mixed use commercial. Um, and we're, we're trying to push that to a high bar uh, in terms of what that project would look like. Uh, so it's, it's been a bit of a challenge, but they continue to kind of go through that entitlement process and we'll see what, uh, what comes of that. But there's definitely a commercial uh, interest in that property and uh, 
just need to see if we can get to the finish line on that entitlement. So just a few updates there on the entitlement side of things. Do we have the uh, sort of the planning and zoning tools that will um, allow these new developments both on the west side and the residential component and the east side and the commercial component and perhaps residential component to, to upgrade the quality and, and bring some of the new features that we talked about uh, during the NRS discussion that, that excite people? And make people want to want to be there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you know the mixed-use commercial zone designation uh, has architectural and site design standards that are embedded in in the process, um, and so those are you know integral to our review process. Uh, one of the things that we really focus on these kind of mid-side sites is connectivity, right? So making sure that we're getting uh, street and pedestrian connectivity right. Uh, and forward-looking so that when adjacent properties redevelop or other opportunities present themselves, particularly associated with the new road configurations associated with the highway, that we're creating that long-term connectivity, uh, stronger orientation of buildings to the street, uh, stronger uh, design of streetscape, i.e. street furnishings and broad sidewalks and street trees along, uh, along Kipling as well as Kind of an internal local street network. So and this might the, be informed by the by the design that happens in the uh, in the in the new interchange. Absolutely. And, and yeah, so everything would, we're doing. It is, would come together as a unit. Right. Okay. We're, we're looking at kind of short-term solutions that anticipate those long-term solutions, knowing that uh, the the timing uh, of the improvements to the the interchange are are undetermined. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess, you know, as it relates to the north side of I-70 uh, I there, uh, because that's in what's now called an opportunity zone, the, uh, the available capital for private development does appear to be uh, more robust than it would be otherwise because it does have that opportunity zone designation. And I'd like to see us uh, take significant steps to either identify potential investors for that area or develop tools in some way to encourage investment because of the Opportunity zone designation. The uh, the amount of money that may be available is is astronomical. So I just want to make sure that we take advantage of as much of that uh, either undeveloped land on the north side of I-70 or uh, existing businesses that could be revitalized significantly because of the opportunity zone investments. And if we want to accomplish anything close to uh, you know revitalizing that quarter, it's going to be because of that opportunity zone designation. So. Anything we can do to promote that, encourage that, would be helpful. And I, I know, yeah. Yeah, I know Steve Art, our economic development manager, is well aware of those um, opportunities. Speaking of which, it, you know, we do also have urban renewal in place in that corridor. So we've certainly uh, communicated to some of the property <coughs> owners there that that, if the, to, to your comment, Mayor, if that could take that project even to the next level, you know, b beyond what is required right. by the mixed use commercial zoning, that you know, that's another tool that's that's in place. Well, I think if we if, if we sort of Focus not on what's required, but what's desired, and you know that that we help ourselves that way. And I also, um, you know, this is also a gateway into Arvada, and I know that Arvada uh, will be be interested in what we're doing in the new interchange, and what opportunities we might be able to do to sort of share development opportunities between the two of us. And your, your sidekick here is on top of that. I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Good. we've been talking to them about. All right. Any, any further questions? Okay. Thank you very much. That will uh, conclude item number three. And I believe that gets us to um, item number four, which is staff reports. Mr. Goff. Yes. Um, sorry about this, the late. I know it's late, but um, it's kind of a timely issue. Um, you all received an email from me, and you may have received an email or a call from uh, a business in town, um, a dog boarding business on Wads 45th and Wadsworth. Um, you may have seen a couple news stories on Channel 7 and Fox News. Um, uh, essentially, um, they received a building, uh, our business license from the city back in, was it July? Um, uh, they, they have not actually received a business license yet. They, oh, they, received, they, rec they received our comment letter from yeah. a zoning standpoint. We're, there's still an outstanding building permit, so we haven't signed off on the final business license until they close out that building permit. Okay. But, but they got a zoning letter from us on July 18th. So th their intent was to open a, um, a dog training center with a, um, accessory use of, of 
uh, daycare and um, boarding, and it's in a C1 zone district, and in a C1 zone district, outdoor um, uh, boarding or, or dog runs are not allowed in C1, similar to, I guess, would be a veterinarian um, of uh, place that we have several in the city, right, that are in, in C1, are they in C1? I'm not yeah, sure if the Weirds Animal Hospital's in C1. You, um, you can do, veterinary clinics are allowed in C1, provided they have no outdoor runs. Okay. And, uh, and kennels are only allowed with outdoor runs in agricultural and industrial That's districts. True. So again, this is in C1. Um, the intent when uh, uh, the owner first came to the city was uh, dog training. There wouldn't be any outdoor use um, or outdoor dog runs. Um, that was made very clear to the to the applicant. Um, but as things moved along, um, they now want to do outdoor um, outdoor play areas for their dogs. Um, we told them that it's not allowed in their current zoning. Um, and again, the, the owner I know has reached out to some of you. I'm not sure if, if the lobbying has, has worked, um, if this is something that city council wants to consider um, bringing back at a study session to talk about what's allowed in, in this zone district. If, if yep. And a special use permit uh, application and process is not Applicable here? Special use permit is required in, in ag and industrial um, when they go there, but it's not allowed in a C1 even with a special use permit. Mm -hmm. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As it relates to the proximity or adjacency to, uh, I don't know if that's a word, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's proximity to other zone districts, uh, specifically residential. That there is another code prov uh, provision somewhere else that relates to that a dog run can't be within 25 feet of a residential zone district of some sort. So if we were to apply this in a C1 zone district, would that 25 foot setback for a dog run adjacent to residential still apply or would we be coming up with a whole new setback requirement for commercial? Yeah, I think in our kennel regs, which again are in A1 and IE zone districts, are uh, there is the requirement of the separation from the outdoor dog activity from residential property lines of 25 feet. I believe that's in there. Uh, so, yeah, if I mean, I think that's fundamentally the issue is right is, is noise and, you know, potentially odor, though that certainly can be managed the, a little harder to manage the noise. But I think that's always been our presumption of, of why these sets of rules are in place is that, you know, I, arguably most of our C1 zone districts are adjacent to residential. Um, and so, you know, creating that potential point of conflict with outdoor, you know, dog activity on a, on a larger scale uh, for a commercial facility has been, always been our presumption of why those sections of the code are the way they are. I guess that would be uh, my concern is that, you know, in one-off situations, uh, the, the circumstances might be appropriate, but as a city policy or as a, um, you know, a ongoing issue. Uh, there, there may be other properties that uh, we absolutely would not want this type of activity to occur, but because we approved it in uh, C1 or what have you, that now we're, we're stuck with that. So it, it goes back to this other issue about being proactive versus reactive. But I think that in this circumstance, given what the city staff has presented so far, is that we've, we've informed the property owner about what's permitted and what's not, and that now this is something different. So. I don't know if, uh, would we need to go through the process of allowing this by special use in C1 and then have them apply through that uh, special use permit to allow for that? Because that seems like the only you know, maneuvering that we could do to permit this. I think that's one of the options that we thought about. You could, council could decide to make this a special use in C1, but then, and, and I've, I've spoken to the property owner, I said even if council decided that, you would have to go through a special use permit, which requires neighborhood meetings, and, and there's no guarantee still um, that it would be allowed. Yeah. Um, that's one option. The other option is, is to just allow this use in, see, what, what was the other option that we had? I can't remember, there was another option we came up with. Yeah, the, I mean, the options are you know, probably endless, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you, could just, you could allow it in a greater number of zone districts, whether, that, whether yeah. that be C1 or, or mixed use or whatever. Um, I guess the other thing to point out is, uh, our, our code is actually silent to the issue of doggy daycare, right? Which is, 
essentially they're running a training facility with doggy daycare aspects that are a pretty significant component of it. Uh, and then boarding that's associated with kind of an intensive training program for, for dogs where they stay there for two weeks and get trained and stay there overnight as well. Uh, so again, which is why we communicated to them, yes, you can do the boarding, but you can't do it with outdoor runs. And you can't do the training with outdoor runs. Um, they, um, and that was an interpretation of our code, right? So we were basically saying that doggy training, doggy daycare, if it's inside, uh, is similar enough to veterinary clinics that we will allow it provided there's no outdoor runs. Uh, so it would really be a discussion of do you want to define doggy daycare uh, or training or, 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 or both um, and expand the class of zoning districts that it might be allowed in either as a use by right or as a use by special use. Are you telling us we need to have some zoning for extended stay <laughs> doggy care? Yeah. yeah. Ms. Hoppy? Uh, so we can look at allowing special use permits in C1. They're not allowable currently, correct? But we can look at changing that regulation so that we can then look at special use permits for C1. <clears throat> I'd like to ask for a consensus to look at um, changing the C1 zoning in that we al can allow for people to apply for a special use permit. You can't apply for a special use permit at all. So no, no, for a kennel, for dogs. For any special use permit, I mean the same, the same as when we did with the car sales and the Subaru automotive, their special use permits, they come in, we discuss it, and if we don't, I mean that's, it's at our, it's at our, you know, discretion it, to allow a special use on a property or not. If I could just uh, request clarification, uh, I guess what what class of uses, right? So, so right now we don't allow kennels with outdoor runs in any of our commercial districts. It's strictly A1 uh, and industrial employment. Um, we allow veterinary clinics if they don't have outside runs in C1. So. I think the question that Mr. Urban was perhaps asking is what range of dog types of uses would be available to have outdoor activities in a C1 district okay, through so a special use permit. I guess so what I don't understand I would, is that, you know, like when we did the Subaru, when we did the, the thing for the Subaru mechanic guys, um, their use was not allowed on that property. And so they had applied for a special use permit so that they could use what, so they could do what they wanted on that property. So I guess I'm not really understanding. I'm saying in C1, you're telling me in C1, there's no, 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 nothing. No, no special use permit. You're not no, there is, it. there is, just not for these uses. So it's oh. just a question of, so in the, in the okay. super, super pro application, I mean, our code says light automotive, permitted use, heavy automotive, am I saying this right? Special, special use. use. <laughs> okay. Um, it would be so it would be in our in our definition under kennels only allowable in uh, agricultural industrial c1 with special use well you could but that would be a even broader expansion I think the the simplest expansion would be and I'm just this is just my suggestion uh, would be to add a definition of doggy daycare with out and then to to the definition of doggy daycare and to the definition of veterinary clinics, you could allow them, as is currently the case for vet clinics, without outdoor runs as a permitted use uh, in C1 zone districts, and then make any outdoor activities associated with those two uses, that being vet clinics and daycare slash training facilities, as a special use permit under in the C1 zone district. I mean, I guess I just don't like doing policy just for one particular person. And so what I was, what I, I'm sorry, I, I was misunderstanding that it wasn't just that the, do, that the outdoor kennels weren't allowed in special use permit in C1. I thought it was that C1, you can't have any special use permits. Oh, so no. And I was really no. confused because yeah, like, maybe that was a C something else. But so, um, so I'd like to withdraw my consensus. Ms. Dozman? Yeah, I'm, I'm having a, a hard time. Like, I'm having a real issue with this whole let's change policies around single-use 
you know, issues. I mean, what what is, what is the process of um, like informing the owner or the potential business owner of the zoning? I mean, what what is our responsibility and like versus their due diligence? Like, can you maybe clarify that a little bit for me sure. so that I understand whether it's you know our issue with policy and zoning or if it's really their issue of being negligent? Yeah, I, I, I'll just tell you the facts as I know them. Um, you know, we got the the inquiry via the business license to do, and I think it started more with pod questions, planner of the day, you know, asking questions of what, what could they do in this on this property, uh, and they just they described principally a dog training facility, uh, and then that as those conversations continued, they it kind of evolved into oh, and we would like to have some daycare as well um, and potentially some boarding associated with the training. Um, they indicated that both the daycare and the, tr and the uh, rooming and boarding would be accessory uses. So based on that, I'd say we were actually fairly generous in our code interpretation to begin with to say, okay, doggy daycare is not specifically defined. Um, training is probably similar enough to a vet clinic that we could say it's a similar use and it's permitted in the same fashion that uh, a vet clinic would be in C1. So we issued them, in my opinion, a very clear letter that said, we'll approve your training facility as a, as a use similar to a vet clinic. Um, we'll approve as accessory uses, rooming and boarding of those pets while they're training. So not just rooming and boarding, but associated with the training. Uh, and we'll approve um, some doggy daycare kind of associated with the training as well as an accessory use. And in doing so, we said at least two, if not three times in that letter, provided they have no outdoor runs. Uh, they interpret that to mean that they couldn't have what they characterize as a traditional outdoor run, which is the you know little run that comes out of the kennel, right? Uh, we think, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that 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 that's a very generous interpretation in their favor that it wouldn't include the much larger outdoor run that would be associated with the doggy daycare, right? So they read the letter as limiting it to just the tiny outdoor run that's associated with a dog being able to get in and out to do their business uh, for a boarding facility traditionally. Um, we think that's a very, would be a very generous interpretation of our letter to not ask the question of, oh, by the way, can we do an outdoor run that's available to 30 dogs all day during all of our operations? So that's what they relied upon. And what they didn't ask us was when they started to install a fence around a you know, 40 by 100 uh, dog play area. And that's when this issue came up. So you think we have a pretty defensible position on the on what constitutes a dog run, and I mean, why would a why would a little dog run be not okay, and then and then the whole yard be okay? That's exactly is that, my, is that, my, my do, am theory. Am I getting yeah, it there? Exactly. Okay. I mean, dog runs are impactful uh, and only allowed in, under certain conditions because they create noise and odor, right? And to expand the scale of that noise and odor to a doggy daycare facility uh, seems very presumptive that somehow we would think that okay, even though we don't think the lesser is okay. okay. And this is really for information for council. This is really not an, not an action item. So there's no reason there, there's. Yeah, unless council wants to give his directions to do anything. Uh, otherwise, no. Okay. Additional um, staff reports. No. Is that it? Okay. Um, we're moving on to item number five, elected officials reports. We'll do this by a show of hands. If you have something, Ms. Dozeman. Go vote. Turn your ballots in by tomorrow at 7 p.m. There's a ballot drop-off box right outside City Hall. Get your ballots in. You can vote in here, too. Very good. And we'll have, yes, we'll have on-site voting here in this room tomorrow, 7, to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Mr. Fitzgerald. I was just going to say, and your vote will count, although it may not count uh, tomorrow night. It will, be, it will count the next day. Thank you. Any other? Um, I would. Uh, I would like to. I've been out of the city on vacation for the last uh, couple of three weeks, and I want to thank you all, the 
city council and my mayor pro tem and the staff for keeping this place together mm -hmm. at a restful time and looking forward to the future. So anyway, if there's no more business before the council, we will stand adjourned. Thank you.